Hey, my name is Chris Brennan, and you're listening to the Astrology Podcast. In this episode, we're going to be doing a deep dive into the meaning of the zodiac sign Virgo and some of its characteristics and traits in the context of astrology. So joining me today are astrologers Tony Howard and Rosalie. Welcome, both of you. Hi, thank you. Hey, Chris. Thanks for having us. Yeah. So I'm really excited to do this um, discussion. We're most of the way through Virgo season, but we actually we caught it um, and this is perfect. I wanted to take the opportunity to do this episode with you two in person here in the studio in Denver. So thanks for coming in today. Um, so we're gonna we're gonna talk a lot about the characteristics and keywords associated with Virgo. Uh, we're gonna talk about some celebrity charts occasionally that are relevant in terms of of that sign, um, and basically just do a very detailed sort of take or overview of the meaning of that sign in astrology. So um, first, detailed is that really appropriate for <laughs> yeah. Virgo? Maybe? I think you've uh, got the wrong two people. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I kind of pulled that one out. Out, but we'll see if it's appropriate here. Um, sometimes I start by talking about credentials. I know you, Tony, have some pretty good credentials. In the last episode, the Leo episode, they started, and I had Nick Dagan Best and Joe on, and they had a little bit of a stellium measuring contest about <laughs> who had the bigger Leo stellium. Um, but you, you, I think, in terms of stellium so far, might kind of like take the cake a little bit. Well, I was born just a couple weeks later than Nick, so uh, I have all of his Virgo planets, but I have a few more. <laughs> okay, so you've taken the Leo planets and you've like re- I've converted them. them into the superior sign of Virgo. I like that. <laughs> beautiful, beautiful. That's for you, Nick. <laughs> okay. Um, and Rosalie, you're also a Virgo? Yes, I have my Virgo sun and Mercury. I also have my North Node there, but I am nowhere near <laughs> your stature of Virgo placements. <laughs> All right, brilliant. Um, so we're going to talk about Virgo. Let me show the stats chart really quick just to give some grounding about some of the basic uh, things associated with Virgo. So this is the symbol for Virgo for those watching the video version. Um, Virgo is a nocturnal or a feminine sign depending on how you look at that. It's an earthy sign. It's mutable. The primary planet associated with Virgo is the planet Mercury. It's also said to be the sign of the exaltation of Mercury, the fall of Venus, and the sign of the detriment or exile of Jupiter. So those are some of the basic stats. Here's the wheel of the signs of the zodiac, and Virgo is the sixth sign in order, starting from the first sign at the vernal equinox, which is Aries. So this is essentially marking almost the halfway point through my series on the signs of the zodiac. And Virgo is the sign that follows after the last sign we did last month, which is Leo, and the sign after this will be Libra. All right, so where should we start? So this is the second Mercury ruled sign, and that might be a good starting point for talking about this. Is uh, the previous Mercury ruled sign was Gemini, which is an airy sign and a diurnal sign that tends to be more um, extroverted. But when we get to Virgo, we have a different side of Mercury, which is one, it's an earthy sign. So the primary quality is is earth and dryness. And then um, it's also a nocturnal sign, so it's less extroverted, and you might say more introverted, or there's different ways of phrasing that. Um, but just talking about in the context of how it compares to Gemini might be a little bit of a good starting point. How do each of you conceptualize Virgo or Virgo energy? I think that uh, I, I think that's a pretty cool place to start. Um, I just was thinking about Gemini to Virgo and the introvert extrovert thing. I mean, it definitely is. Um, there's definitely a, a thing about Virgos not necessarily what is I was just reading about this not wanting not needing the accolades but ap appreciating appreciation so for a job well done like if you've worked hard at something we like to be noticed for the work we've contributed but we don't necessarily want to be put on stage and given a big award <laughs> for it you know I've always said I'd be very happy as a ghostwriter you know for a really great book I don't need to have my name on the cover and I think that speaks to that quality a little bit, uh, that difference maybe between uh, Gemini and, and Virgo. Yeah, I like that. So there's uh, a mercurial, almost like research-oriented quality to it of being okay doing the one that does like the tangible work sometimes, um, sometimes behind the scenes and sometimes in like a support role almost. And um, you know, wanting to have some recognition for that, but not needing to be like the front man 
And in that way, actually, that's another thing that we've talked about throughout this series, how each sign seems to have almost like a corrective quality or corrective function that follows after and balances out some of the qualities of the sign that came before. And the one sign right before Virgo, of course, is Leo, where you do have much more of that quality of like wanting to be at the front, wanting to be at the forefront of things, um, sometimes wanting to like shine and have your qualities on display in a very public manner and wanting to receive recognition for that. Whereas Virgo um, counterbalances that. And I think you get a bit more more humble of a quality of energy at this point. Yeah. And wanting just more interested in doing it well or or doing it right or fixing it. I mean, we can go in all those directions. Yeah. I'm sure we'll get there eventually. Having that like patience to just sit there and work at the hard stuff, the Absolutely. not so pretty stuff. <laughs> But getting to the point in that hard work, uh, you know, deserves that appreciation to an extent. I also see Virgo as, you know, both the exaltation and um, domicile of Mercury. It's not just the domicile. It's also exalted there. So I always joke to every Gemini stelling my meat that I'm still superior as a mercurial ruled individual. <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah. How yeah. does that go for you? <laughs> um, they usually get kind of rowdy about it, but they can't argue because they know that I'm right. So I mean, well, luckily, Geminis tend to have short attention spans. So the initial <laughs> argument- they've, they've already forgotten. Yeah, about they've already moved on. So that, that works in your favor. Um, yeah. So, uh, what are some of the other qualities or when it comes to that, that notion of either, um, there being a corrective quality to Virgo following after Leo or, um, of that quality of, of Mercury being the second Virgo being the second Mercury ruled sign. Um, where do you go with that? Or what are some of the other contrasts that come up for you? I always like to look at the, the first little 10 degrees of Virgo, um, because that is a, a deck in very solid, um, solidly placed in patience, waiting for a fruit tree, knowing that it's a long, difficult process. It takes a lot of time. And you go from a fiery, active Leo, you know, it's a double Mars rule deck in, um, preceding the first one of Virgo. So you go from this active state of energy, almost a need to defend your individuality, the, the need to argue about whose stellium is bigger, you know, and then you go into this calm, patient, it takes time kind of part of Virgo. And that's just kind of the shift that I see that corrective behavior doing like almost a 360 completely. That's a really good point. There is a patient quality and that's it's similar in some ways to Taurus, which is the first earth sign mm -hmm. we saw where there was initially in Aries, this really fast quality and this really impatient, like wanting to do things as quick as possible and having like the need for speed but then as soon as we got to Taurus things like slowed down with the first fixed um, earth sign and this notion of like not wanting to be rushed was really um, very prominent in that discussion and in that archetype so that's a good point about Virgo though because Virgo also has some of that even though it's a mutable sign so that it has some um, adaptability or some flexibility it also um, as an earth sign I feel like is okay with things moving at a slower pace and it reminds me of Taurus also in that with Taurus we encountered some love of like plants and growing things and what it takes to like nurture and grow a plant and part of that taking like time and patience and I think Virgo also has some of that quality as well right yeah it's like they understand the long process to get the beautiful result hmm. I think that Virgo can develop patience. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not sure if it's like inborn, but yeah, I think it's definitely a trait that can be mm -hmm. cultivated. What happens to me a lot, you know, I like you, Chris, I work with a lot of technology in my work and I've been in situations in public situations where we're doing like a live streaming uh, live event where it's like partially online and partially in person and uh, the internet goes out or something goes wrong. And afterwards, everyone comments on how patient I appeared. And I'm like, I'd Definitely did not feel like that on right. the inside. Like, it's like in internally screaming. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Exactly. yeah. Okay. You know, right? I feel like it's just the the mercurial mind. The Gemini's express it outwardly, and the Virgos just hold it all in. Like mm. it's still happening. It's just we don't express it. We're right. able to have that stoic face. Yeah, that could speak to what we started out talking about as well. Yeah, with mm -hmm. the polarities. Sure. So in terms of whether it's um, more of an internal and reflective thing that happens on the inside in some ways in like a lunar or nocturnal sense versus something that's expressed outwardly as more of like a solar thing. 
Yeah, and I think Virgo offers a. I think you you already said it earlier about the humility. You know, that's that's something that's introduced to kind of counter some of the Leo tendency. Although I will say that I think we sometimes overdo that. You know, at that at the extroverted version of Leo because there's definitely an introverted version of Leo that I've seen as well, and other things in the chart can kind of coalesce to create that that environment to for that to be expressed in a more introverted way, but. Um, a phrase I've heard before that I really love for that is is quiet dignity for Leo. Mm. But with Virgo, we have the willingness to to look in. Well, we were talking about going inward just now, but to look inward and to see, you know, what could I have done wrong here and what could I have done better? You know, this is what I could be. This is what I am. And how do I get, how do I get here? And then taking the next steps to get there is where that's how to keep Virgo on track. If you stay focused on this is what's wrong, I think that's where a lot of the problems kind of emerge. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. That's a really good point because I think that gets to one of the core functions of Virgo, which is the ability to be critical and the ability to be self-critical um, or to, to criticize others, to have the ability to see the flaws in something because one of the things that Virgo does really well, and I think one of its core archetypal functions is the ability to see things that are very small and that other people might miss or that other people might overlook almost like a microscope um, but in doing so that means when you when you're able to see all of the details and you can see all those little things that other people miss um, even just like minor minute differences that can bring um, the flaws and in things into greater focus as well sort of like if you're looking at if somebody's just looking at a diamond from far away, it looks like a diamond. But if somebody takes a microscope up to it, they can see that there's like cracks and imperfections in it or something like that. Virgo has often that superhuman ability or that special strength to be able to see um, the flaws or the cracks or the minute details and things. And sometimes that can give them a reputation when it's projected outwards of being overly critical. But one of the things that's important is that same function is often also projected inwards and it can be um, a self-criticalness as well. Oh, definitely. <laughs> I think it's also um, when they try to perfect things, that's just what they're trying to do. They're trying to like see the flaws in order to make it better, but then they try, they end up ruining the perfection of whatever they're trying to do by trying to perfect it because it just crumbles beneath them. They file the nail too short. They whittle the wood too much and it snaps kind of thing. Um, Absolutely. I, you can take it too far. And so, you know, not aiming for perfection, but just aiming to improve it as that can usually set that can. part of your psyche mm -hmm. in a little bit better balance, I think. Is that something though that may be hard, especially that a lesson that like people with heavy Virgo placements that takes a while or is a lifetime thing to learn once they grow older into like adults or become more mature, that perfection might not always be possible? Because is there still like the desire to achieve perfection in the sense of minimizing or or getting ready, rid of all flaws or imperfections in something, but then maybe at some point realizing that that's not always possible? I feel like that depends on the placement that we're talking about and what mm -hmm. transits they've gone through and what kind of energy they've gone through. Because I've met plenty of Virgos that are older individuals, like in their 50s, that still act like they're an 18 year old underdeveloped Virgo who whines and cries when things don't go their way. But I've met plenty of younger Virgos that seem like they're ready to go up on a mountain peak and spend the rest of their life living in solitude because they just understand everything. Yeah, I think, I think you're right. I mean, it, it just depends on, on your experience and how you've integrated the, the messages. I think kind of, you know, life naturally teaches you um, where to, what direction to go in for your own growth and evolution. And for Virgos, I think this is one of them. A really great um, set of books, I think, that's really useful for Virgo that I always recommend for clients is pretty much anything by Brene Brown. She's a Scorpio um, with Pluto and Virgo. And I think you were talking about internalizing that self-criticism a little bit, and we could talk about that more too in that whole process. But I think that Pluto and Virgo generation can kind of take that to the next level. It's kind of an art form, elevated art form for us. <laughs> right. And it, Pluto has that tendency to take things to extremes. Yeah. Yeah. And so the the extreme version of self-deprecation and self-criticism and, you know, uh, I'm just a useless worm kind of uh, self-talk, you know, and 
um, her books, the, the first one, I always get it wrong. It's either called The Gifts of Imperfection or The Wisdom of Imperfection. I think it's The Gifts of Imperfection. But, you know, the title alone kind of <laughs> right. tells you everything you need yeah. to know. But there's great stuff in the book, too. And it's so, so helpful to get those parts back on track. And I think the um, opposite sign uh, here, Pisces, gives us a really great keyword for unlocking that. And it's allowing. I think it's a, a great word for Virgo. So in this context, allowing what is. And uh, and then I think all healing kind of comes out of that place of of allowing and acceptance of, of what is. Yeah, that's a really good point. So that brings up our first, one of our other important contrasts, which is just between uh, Virgo and its opposing sign, which is Pisces. And a lot of the meaning of Virgo can be understood by contrasting it with some of the meanings of Jupiter in as the ruler of Pi or the traditional ruler of Pisces. So um, one of the main things that comes up is that um, Virgo, as an Earth sign ruled by Mercury, tends to focus on the details and the smaller things, whereas Pisces, ruled by Jupiter, tends to focus more on the big picture type type things. So um, are there any other contrasts that come up to either of you in terms of that contrast between like Virgo and Pisces? I feel like Virgo is words and Pisces is not words like... Uh, like feelings or emotions? Like instrumental music almost, mm. how it just has no lyrics to it. But then Virgo is the 17 page long poem. <laughs> <laughs> right. Right. We were just talking about uh, Mercury and Pisces in, in one of my classes earlier today, and I like to bring up the image of you, you explain things through interpretive dance <laughs> <laughs> right <laughs> that's a good one that's a good one yeah. yeah yeah but yeah i think that that's it's such an interesting contrast and it's it's really i mean the uh the essential dignities it's the basic the first level of them is so it's so interesting the way it's laid out and it's so symmetrical and you know um well organized and it's just really it's it's interesting just to contemplate you know the exaltations of Jupiter versus the exaltations of Mercury and and the just the connection between them mm. and what are those connections between Mercury and and Jupiter but uh, you know we need both you know the the beauty is in the details that's a phrase that we use but the big picture is important too of course Virgo can get lost in the details obviously and you can also get lost in the big picture though Pisces can get lost in the big picture mm -hmm. I feel like that whole polarity is very healing in that sense where one gets the big picture one gets a small picture they kind of even each other out in a good healing dynamic but both signs individually you know represent healing in some sort of way helping serving kind of yeah they did that is a commonality isn't mm -hmm. it service oriented a bit of yeah. self sacrificial tendencies too Absolutely. between the both of them yeah. Right. There's more of a like a tangible practical quality of how can I help you materially with Virgo um, what, what have you meant? Like, how can I fix your car or something like that versus with Pisces? It's like, how can I save your soul or something like that? Yeah. It's yeah. a little bit controversial figure for some people, but mother Teresa, a great example of a, a Virgo who is mm -hmm. like just practically, you know, helping people get their basic needs met to some extent. Um, yeah. Versus like some kind of spiritual teaching that's inspiring or uplifting or yeah. meaningful. Right. Or just compassion as a healing you know, tool coming out of Pisces. That makes sense. And then, sorry, go ahead. No, go ahead. No, I was just going to say Virgo is kind of like the, that opposite, you know, the material side of that, but it's the, not so much, well, I guess it could be, how can I help your car? But it's, I will do anything for you. I will be there in a heartbeat. I will serve you however you need to be served, like physically. And that's just like kind of a lot at sometimes. I know a lot of uh, Virgo individuals who can be a little bit too much for people when they try to help and they try to serve. I don't recommend customer service to them because they wear themselves through the wall with that. I was hoping we were going to go there a, a bit. Yeah, customer because service is not that Virgo territory. Unsolicited advice. Advice. We should talk about that too. <laughs> Virgo's <laughs> oh, yeah, masterful. <laughs> and and uh, I always tell Virgos, you know, ask first if the if person would care, like to hear your advice. <laughs> right. But uh, what were you saying just a second ago? You were talking about the- Customer service. Oh, how Virgos would just like wear themselves down by yes. being in a customer service job because they would try way too hard. They would yeah. work themselves to the bone. That's yeah. a good point because some of the most helpful people I know are Virgos or have heavy Virgo energy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think there's something I wanted, I was hoping to be able to say, which was that like, um, I think that works really well when- 
people are asking for help in the right way. Yeah, but that doesn't <laughs> You know where happen. I'm going. Yeah, you know, know going. exactly where yes. you're going. But when there's an expectation or um, a feeling of entitlement or if, or also in customer support, you know, if, if it's coming from a place of entitlement and, and rudeness yeah. and then, you know, the Virgo can definitely, uh, I'm speaking for myself only, not be as helpful. <laughs> no. You speak for, I mean, Mercury is still a trickster right. planet, you know. Right. If you want right. to talk back, we'll see. Okay, we'll make this, we'll charge you double for this right. accidentally. <laughs> your coupon's expired. Sorry, I'm not right. taking that anymore. Exactly. The message here is be nice to your customer support person. <laughs> no, of course, always. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, so that's a really good point, though, that sometimes in an effort to be helpful, um, and that desire that comes from this deep internal desire to be helpful in some way, um, sometimes that can be like abused by other people or mm -hmm. other people can take advantage of that. And I feel like Virgo is is one of those signs that sometimes could be pushed more or that people could take advantage of more than others because of that internal desire to be helpful or play some sort of support role. Yeah, I think that's right. Yeah, no, I 100% agree. Virgo is the yes man of the Zodiac. Mm, okay. Yeah, so that's a good point in terms of that, in terms of um, not just the helpfulness and the support role, but also um, sometimes the way it relates to some of the other signs, um, like Leo or some of those other signs. Mm -hmm. um, but sometimes a tendency where then in playing that support role, um, that the actual like desires or aspirations of the Vir Virgo can be sublimated to those that they're helping um in that support role which can sometimes be okay if that's their choice but other times it can go maybe too far if they don't put their own personal needs first yeah i mean the you know in healing a really important message is you can't help others unless your cup is full and so mm -hmm. you need to fill your own cup and virgo is one of those signs that can definitely not fill their cup first or needs to learn how to do that or need to needs to just become aware that that's really important Mm -hmm. And then claim, kind of claim that space. And it kind of goes against the natural impulse, which is to sacrifice a bit. And we can go into that a little bit with Pisces too. Yeah. Um, so I wanted to bring, first I wanted to give a shout out to uh, Lisa Scheim and Camille Michelle Gray that helped me with some of the research and notes in putting together this episode. I also did um, a poll on Twitter for keywords for Virgo, as well as celebrities that we'll mention at different points in this episode. Um, but Camille wrote some, really good contrasts I wanted to read out really quickly between Virgo and Pisces that might be good jumping off points for discussion. So she said Virgo um, is about, the keyword is help, whereas Pisces keyword is heal. Uh, Virgo service in the material realm versus service in the realm of consciousness, soul, or spirit. Uh, Virgo operates on preparedness. Pisces operates on faith. Virgo is I have a plan. Pisces is I have a dream. Uh, Virgo's logistical mind versus mystical mind, academic intelligence versus emotional slash spiritual intelligence, practical versus fanciful, physical versus metaphysical, common sense versus sixth sense, self-discipline versus self-deluding, seeks information versus seeks inspiration. That's a really good one. Uh, need to know versus go with the flow. Critical thinker versus big thinker, zooming in versus spacing out. Um, yeah, so those are. I loved all of those, but the first one. You um, did, did. I have to pick one that I don't like. I'm like <laughs> right, you're like, Virgo. we're you talking about the, Virgo. Let's the do problems. it. <laughs> no. yeah, yeah. Might as well. <laughs> right. But what was the first one? Uh, um, help versus heal. So this is where I get to say this phrase I love too. Virgos are tweaky. Um, so sometimes it's just about tweaking it a little bit to right. get it just right. But help versus heal. You know, I think. I think we could use both of those with both signs almost just because, um, you know, we associate actually um, some astrologers will associate um, uh, herbalism and kind of that kind of healing intention. Like a, it's really kind of like an earth application of healing, but it is healing. And a lot of Virgos will get drawn to um, body work or kind of healing work with people where there's it, there's a physical component or a real helping component that kind of brings the healing into a tangible more tangible space so i think um i think we could yeah yeah that's a really good point that um there is a major uh medical component and and you know the you know ancient 
symbol or even the symbol still now of like medicine is like Hermes caduceus mm -hmm. um, as for the medical profession and for healers. And I think that's definitely more of a Virgo thing than a Gemini thing. Right. Um, that, that focus on like medicine and, and healing and doing things to practically help people's physical constitution. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I mean, we can also see that it's the sixth sign in the zodiac. And I know that I don't think either of you subscribe to the A to Z or one the through natural, 12. Yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, zodiac. But, you know, being in the sixth house, Virgo ruling over the six, you know, just kind of also adds to that kind of healing quality, but also physical health. Like it's your physical body. It's not your mental health like Pisces would be. It's your physical body. Mm. Yeah, that's a good point. And that's that's one of those areas where there is like, where if somebody was trying to make an argument where I feel like it's more compelling if you're trying to make a 12 letter alphabet argument where there is overlap between that that healing component of Virgo and and the sixth house focus on illness and things mm -hmm. like that. Um, yeah, it, it definitely seems to be a focus on fixing something, repairing something or making it better. So it's healing in that context, right? Mm -hmm. Maybe this just a guess, maybe there's an impulse in Pisces to bring something whole, make something whole again. Um, you know, to come back into that big picture view, so to speak. I don't, right. just an idea. But with the the Virgo, I mean, I did body work for nine years and I was really focused on um, very specific detailed work. This is how, this is what people would write in my reviews. <laughs> I was like, really? You don't know my chart and you're saying that. So you but, did body work for people to help mm -hmm. heal people? Yeah. And I, and I focused on healing people with specific conditions, ailments, problems. Anyway, uh, you know, just things like, they were coming to me to fix something. Basically, I was just like the the body mechanic. I should have used yeah. that as my website. That would have been <laughs> right. so good, so yeah, clever. Yeah, yeah. yeah we, we were talk that came in because we were talking about car repair before we. Yeah, I have uh, car oil over my pretty Mercury journal, so just yeah. a, a side effect of needing to change your own oil and not wanting to have to pay somebody right. a ridiculous <laughs> amount of money to do it. Yeah, that's, that's what, very Virgo. I think. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> totally. Well, and being do it a, yourself. Yeah, yeah. Do it yourself, and also being kind of like a jack of all trades. Like mm -hmm. Virgo, I think more than any other sign can sometimes encompass that quality of being a jack of all trades, but master of none. Never. Mm. Uh, it's how I feel about my life constantly. I've been told multiple times in my life that I'm really good at a lot of useless things, but I can't do the really big important things. Like that's just time. You'll get there. Yeah, yeah I guess. <laughs> It's a good Virgo aim, though mastery, mastery of something. Um, especially if you don't call it mastery. <laughs> yeah, I don't like, think that anybody can be a master of anything truly, right. but you know, you can get to like a level of very like high regard. But working to improve, yeah, yeah, absolutely. always working to improve. But yeah. in doing that, you know that you'll always need to improve, regardless right. of how much you've known or what you've done. Yeah, so that actually brings up a, a Virgo that you mentioned, Tony, before we start recording, um, but a director, but David Fincher. Mm -hmm. um, and that's a really good example of a, of a Virgo or somebody with prominent Virgo placements. We don't know his birth time, so we don't know his rising sign, but we do know he has some placements there. And his directing style famously is that he'll shoot like 50 takes or like 100 takes or sometimes even more takes of like the same scene until his actors are just like exhausted from shooting the same scene over and over again and then um from that he'll be able to like look through all the takes and just like piece together exactly what he wants because he knows exactly what he wants to see and he'd rather like shoot a bunch of those and then have a ton to choose from in editing rather than um not or rather than having to go with the imperfection of a scene that doesn't meet up to his his standard of, of what he had in mind Absolutely. That's something I learned shooting video of, I mean, I've never made films, but just shooting video of astrology events and things. And, 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 uh, when you're in the editing room and you've got a bad shot and you have nothing else to choose from, that's right. the worst, you know? So, so, uh, that makes sense to me that he would go in that direction. And, uh, and then he's, he's a great example too, of a person who really embodies the Virgo craftsperson archetype. You know, where he's really um, masterful in his craft and from lots of different perspectives. And and he, he's fine-tuned that over time as well. Although he came out pretty good at the beginning too. Even doing music, music videos, his music videos are pretty cool. Is his whole editing stuff Virgos? Because if they're not, bless their souls. <laughs> <laughs> yes, editing is a great, uh, that's a classic Virgo um my Virgo rising best friend is a editor, editor yeah. yeah, film editor. When I, I, I 
went to film, I studied film in college a bit and that's what I was intending to do with mm -hmm. it was film editing. And, and I did a little bit of it. It's, I, I love the work, but it is, um, it's laborious and a lot of Virgos are drawn to that kind of work. Um, but it can be, can be mind numbing. I don't yeah. know. Give me a jar of pennies to count. I'll sit there for a couple hours. And get it, you know, <laughs> totally. <laughs> Sign me up. That's a really good point, though. That uh, general archetype for Virgo's editing and the ability, like the superhuman ability of an editor, to like see the flaws and imperfections of something. Um, Lisa Scheim has a Virgo moon, and I thanked her in you know the introduction to my book because. Very late in the process, she read it right before it was going to go to publication, like a week or two before, and and just found hundreds of typos that I did not see. Right. Um, with this, like, just superhuman inability to read through something and see when something is out of place, and that is something that I really admire, and I think is like a like a special skill or like a superpower in some instances. But it's something that it seems like people with with Virgo placements tend to share in common. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And maybe a little bit easier to live with if you're a Pisces. <laughs> I don't mm -hmm. know. I'm speaking for the people that live with me. <laughs> right. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> or just, you know, a, a different orientation where that kind of focus doesn't get uh, tedious to them. Yeah. Right. To help balance things out because the Virgo can bring that element into the Pisces life to help them sort of get things together a little bit more or be more regimented, whereas maybe the Pisces' role is maybe to help the Virgo relax a little bit sometimes totally. and, and zoom out and view the big picture. Yeah. Yeah. So editing um, and David Fincher's placements, just really quickly, even though we don't have his birth time, is he has a Sun Pluto Uranus conjunction in Virgo, and then he also has Mercury in late Virgo at the same time. So I think that goes back a little bit to what you were mentioning earlier, having a Sun Pluto conjunction in Virgo and that tendency for um Pluto to take things to extremes. So in that instance, like taking it to the extreme of shooting like a hundred shots of a scene just in order to like get the exact thing that he wants he wants to see. Absolutely. Yeah. And there's a if I remember right, that's part of a a kite pattern as well, where there's a I'm not sure how tight those water planets are, if they're actually in a trine or not. So I think maybe two of them aren't. I think two of them are maybe too wide, but it still visually has that kind of feel where the the Sun and Pluto are kind of opposite Jupiter. I can't see the degrees here. Yeah, it's just early Virgo. Is it just Pluto opposite Jupiter? Here, let me get the actual birth date and I'll cast it in solar fire. So it's August twenty eighth, nineteen sixty two. But I mean, I definitely looked at his chart before, and it works really well with his films, which are not light. Romantic comedies. <laughs> Keanu Reeves has that Pluto Uranus conjunction, right? Yeah. As well. And he's like pretty well known for like The Matrix, which is, you know, not a lovey dovey film. Right. In Virgo, you mean, yeah. 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 yeah and oh, he's son, son in Virgo too. Yeah. Yeah. So it would maybe be, could be conjunct. I don't know his chart by heart. So this is David Fincher's chart with just a noon chart with, um, yeah, Uranus, Sun, Pluto at the beginning of Virgo, and then. Yes, yeah, Mercury the at the end. Oh, and his midhaven shoved in there. Well, the, we we don't know the time, so that oh, we don't know about yeah, the midhaven yeah. or ascendant. But the Jupiter opposite Pluto Sun is pretty tight, and then um, Mars jumps in there. I f I remembered one of the planets isn't in close. Yeah, it's it's the Neptune is a little bit far out from making a grand trine. Although you could you could stretch it a little bit energetically, um, and also if you're just doing aspects by sign, of course. Right. Has, has kind of a grand trine vibe in there. And then the sun um, and uh, Pluto come in there as as the focal planets in, in the kite pattern, which is a really, there can be a lot of gifts in that pattern. And he's he's a great example of it where there's there's a kind of technical mastery in his work that came out even really early where sure he's worked at it and gotten better, but he started out from a pretty... <laughs> Highly functioning place. Yeah, well, that's also a good point. It brings up another facet, which is um, his use of technology and of like he's been a f uh, pushing the limits in terms of um, digital imaging and just about like, every movie that he's done since the '90s, they've used CGI in order to construct more of the sets. And there's just constantly green screens and constantly using CGI in order to perfect the vision of what he wants each set to look like. And that even if you can't get it done in camera, that you do it in post production. Um, but I think that goes back a little bit to sometimes just a facility with like technology and willingness to use technology in order to to meet 
what one's expectations or ends are. Um, so that was a good one. Um, you mentioned Keanu Reeves. Uh, oh, yeah. I just was, I think that his Pluto and Uranus are also like in Virgo for his son. I know. I think his Pluto definitely pretty close is. To yeah. Me. Um, yeah. I don't think it's 1968 though. I, th- I feel like he's maybe 69. I don't know. Don't quote me on that. We're because I saw a lot of celebrities while I was looking with Pluto and Virgo, obviously, but um, I couldn't find a lot of like. Oh, way off. 1964. So I don't know if this is, a, I can't remember if this is a time chart, but here's Keanu Reeves where he has. Um, no degree or 14 degree ascendant in Virgo. Yeah. That's what Astro Data Bank has. Right. Okay. So it's 541 AM. I just don't know what the source of that is, but. If it's like what the rating is. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, but it, regardless, it's Sun, Mercury, Uranus, Pluto in a pretty close tight conjunction in Virgo. Yeah, he's got a Kazemi Sun Mercury. Mm-hmm. Well, one of the things I always think about with him is just like he's an incredibly like humble guy and like most stories about him um, from people are just about him being really humble and like sometimes accidentally like, you know, being at the same hotel as a wedding, but then he'll like take pictures with like the, the couple as part of their their photos or just doing other things like that. I know he's had some really hard experiences that have humbled him in different ways because he suffered some major losses in his life so that may play a factor as role uh, as well but also just um as a celebrity somebody that oftentimes is spoke of as being very humble yeah Mm -hmm. even in interviews his body language is you know he's very accommodating to the other people and Mm -hmm. the humility i think comes through physically in a Mm -hmm. physical way right And, and and if that chart's right um that energy's there on his ascendant yeah, with Virgo rising. Yeah. Um, okay. So those are good keywords. I think we've done we've pulled out some really good important stuff with the the contrast with the the axis of um Pisces and Virgo. Um let's see, why don't we get into some other contrasts? I mean, one that we'll definitely get into more in the next episode on Libra, but are there any contrasts or or what is the corrective quality that Libra has? Um over what happens with with Virgo, none because Virgo is already perfect. Right, perfection has <laughs> I'm been. I'm like sitting here trying to think. <laughs> so it's like once you get to a certain point of, per, it's just all down, it's, it's, it's all it downhill. Stops, so it stops with Virgo. Yeah. yeah, yeah. We are the pinnacle. We're the culmination point of all of astrology. Okay, that's why Mercury is both exalted and has his domicile in Virgo yeah. because it's all downhill for the next like six signs. Yeah, I mean, what other planet does that? I'm just saying. Right. No. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Realistically, though, I think Libra has a good ability to take um, all of that knowledge that they observe from the world around them and do something about it because again we're going from a feminine to a masculine sign Mm -hmm. or um passive to active sure you know who's really good at this uh particular transition and describing it is mark jones i wish he was he was here right now he's uh, i love how he describes the you were talking about it earlier as a corrective between you know from one sign to the next or you could also just think of it as a response you know each sign is a response to the one before it and it tends to work a little bit more in that direction, although I think you could probably do it the other way. But, um, but I think I, I uh, I'm I'm a Virgo Sun person. My partner's Libra Sun, and I think one of the correctives that happens in our relationship is just um, a kind of I want to say a soothing or calming down of that. Are we allowed to call it Virgo neurosis? Uh, <laughs> where, there, where that, by that, what I mean is there, if we were talking about the attention to detail, for instance, where that can get really pointed. I mean, it can cause overthinking, mm-hmm. just overstimulation, Mercury, which is right. anxiety, though. Absolutely. That's when you think about it. It's just mental racing. And I don't know that Libras definitely improves on the anxiety because they can develop anxiety. Yeah, I guess anxiety that's true because they're like, which decision do I do? <laughs> but but definitely there's there is there is a corrective that comes through in terms of a I think a calming influence or at least a a seeking of a peaceful peaceful ground even if Libra doesn't ever achieve that which I'm not sure they do but definitely can be an intention. I think Libra can also separate themselves from the decision whereas Virgos are pretty much no I want it this way so it's going to happen this way. You know. That's a good point like the air response to earth, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. Yeah, lightening things up a bit. You know, I think you can talk about that transition from Capricorn to Aquarius too, how Aquarius kind of literally lightens things up just by when something moves from Capricorn 
to Aquarius, you can feel that density start to lift a bit. Yeah, because there's a. I think some of that goes back to the the quality, the temperamental quality of like dryness being associated with Earth, and that can be really good for like doing the numbers or you know the accounting of something and seeing like the cold hard facts of like how something adds up in terms of the numbers. But there can be a very um, dispassionate kind of cold, colder quality to that in some sense, or it can come off as cold in some ways just looking at the numbers. Versus once you get to Libra, um, there's a focus a little bit more on sometimes like you know how can you make something um, beautiful or how can you make it like artistically appealing, and that's not always something that's done purely based on the numbers, but there can be other elements to that. That's a great point because Virgo is more about how can I make this useful or how can I make it better or what's the practical application mm -hmm. for it, whereas Libra might ask how can we make it prettier. Maybe. Virgo's <laughs> view of pretty is, uh, it was the process long and hard to get through. Did you work really hard to get to whatever you got? Cool. <laughs> right. Now that's beautiful. <laughs> yeah. What is this like perfection in terms of that all of the errors have been ironed out completely yeah. and sort of eradicated? Um, that, then it's beautiful. But Libra is more, um, is this aesthetically appealing? Um, almost a, in a, a different sort of almost intellectual sense, although intellectual isn't the right wing. I'm trying to think of the right term for like an air sign because air mm -hmm. signs are very intellectual, but Libra. Conceptual, yeah. Yeah. Maybe. Maybe um, in terms of like form, like perfectness of form or something like that. Mm -hmm. Sure. Yeah. Um, all right. So I'm trying to think of any other contrast between Libra versus Virgo that might be good to mention at this point as like a Mercury sign versus a, a Venus sign. Both inner planets. Yeah. That's all I can think of. And both kind of have that close relationship to the earth and the sun. Well, and one of the responses is that from that turning inward that we were talking about earlier and the self examination of Virgo to the turning outward in Libra with re more relational oriented sign and, you know, getting input from others. Like it's now time you've done the, the inner work and the focus and you've tried to perfect your craft or perfect you. And now it's time to um, reach out to others for the next stage of that and interact with others. So yeah, that's a really good point. That's actually I was looking at my notes, and Camille wrote in her write up for this that Libra corrects Virgo by bringing in the perspective of another person and by introducing harmony and balance to the frenetic Virgo energy. Libra also knows the creative process is subjective paradoxical gray areas correcting the Virgo tendency to aim for perfection or put life into tidy little boxes. That's right. I think there I think there is something to uh, I don't know if it's just my experience or if it's universal but the tendency to want things to be a bit black and white. I've gotten mm -hmm. past that just through age, you know, just through with time. Mm -hmm. But definitely when I was younger uh th that was more of a <laughs> more of a problem for sure. The black and white kind of thinking or the the wanting things to be really clear, like like almost just wanting there to be an instruction manual for life that just told you how to do it and what was I have screamed many a night <laughs> wishing for that manual. Yeah. <laughs> I had right. to make my own and it was hard. But I I don't know, shattering that black and white mentality from like a really young age for me personally, I just got really excited because I was like, wow, now the whole world is open and mm. I can just look for everything everywhere. And just get into it and deep dive into those nitty gritty neat things, I guess. Yeah. So, but Libra definitely takes that a step further by bringing in other perspectives that mm -hmm. conflict and challenge, and and uh, you know the devil's advocate thing is alive and well in Libra. Yeah. <laughs> and um and yeah, but that that's a nice corrective to that kind of thinking. I think another way to phrase that. And instead of like black and white could be Virgo tends to think in terms of like ones and zeros. Binary. Yeah, yeah. binary or like like code basically. Um, and code and looking at things in terms of like ones and zeros or binary is different than maybe Libra looking at things in terms of like paint colors or things like that. Oh, that's pretty cool. Yeah. I like the way that, that is phrased. Like that makes so much sense in my head. Especially because Venus just loves like it's 20 different shades of pink to choose from. Right. And that's not, there's, that's like a spectrum of the different shades of pink. It's not as clear of a division as like a one and a zero. Mm -hmm. um, but instead, it's more of a, a progression or, or more of a, I can't think of the term for that of shades, but 
Um, it's something that's Scale? more gradient. Yeah. Gradient. Yeah. That's it. It's more flowing and it's harder to distinguish. Like at what point have you really switched from one shade or one color to another? You don't really know. It's something that almost becomes a little subjective and, and there's a, um, not ambivalence, but an ambiguity in the gradient of, of when things have actually changed that makes things less clear. Sorry, I no, will say that Virgos yeah. created hex codes. Right. Yeah. <laughs> we we made sure that we could tell exactly where every color is and what it is and that it's distinct from the other ones. So maybe so that's good. that's Venus and Virgo. Maybe, possibly. Yeah, I, I've got that one, uh, Venus and Virgo. But this is I have a fun anecdote here, both with the he hex codes and the color shades in Libra. But I was working on a website for an astrologer I won't name who is a Libra um, early in the 2000s and uh I, I literally did 21 versions of this website for this particular person. And and they said at one point, I would like the purple to be more jubilant. Oh, no. <laughs> wow. And, and I, I literally- I mean, I, like, What kind of hue saturation? <laughs> like, where, where got, do you want to go with this? I got the hex code. I, I got like <laughs> f f uh, 14 or yeah. 20 of them or however many, a lot of them. And I put them all together on a page and I said, you tell me which one of these is the jubilant one. <laughs> <laughs> right. Anyway, the relationship- disintegrated a bit from there so oh, no. yeah, yeah. that is the fundamental tension right. between virgo and, and libra i think mm -hmm. it captures some of what we were talking about absolutely yeah. that's a perfect antidote honestly i love that um speaking of code uh and of of binary code actually specifically one of the examples that came in from twitter um and that lisa shine put on the list was katherine johnson who has the sun uh and mercury in virgo although we don't know her birth time but she was one of the first black women to work as a NASA mathematician. And she was like the featured in that movie just a few years ago called Hidden Figures about her time at NASA. Um, but her calculations of orbital mechanics at NASA as a, an employee were critical to the success of the first and subsequent US uh, crewed space flights. And she just wrote just like books and books of like code in order to make a lot of that stuff happen where it has to be perfect and and where that um that matter of of perfection actually becomes critical in terms of like life and death situations of you know sending people into outer space or sending people to the moon and you have that perfect example of the behind the scenes work we were talking about and also the not receiving the accolades really um not not having that work seen right and we don't know but you know maybe she was comfortable in that maybe she wasn't i'm not sure but um yeah i think for myself, it's more about the that the appreciation from the people who you're actually working with comes in. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, and that just that takes me back to the idea of an editor, and that's exactly what an editor is because I've seen over the past few years, um, both in my book, but also helping other people with their books, or seeing other people write their books in the past few years, like Demetra writing hers, or, or other people, just the immense immense amount of work that goes into the editing process of something, and it's impossible to ever fully um sometimes like like pay somebody as much as that time that they, they put into it might deserve or even to give them as much credit or, or accolades for that as it might might deserve because the just the very nature of the process of what you're doing almost requires more more energy expenditure than um than you could ever possibly have remuneration for just right. in order to do that yeah, and I think Virgos might be drawn to that kind of work where that becomes challenging, like the amount of hours you spend doing film editing, for yeah. instance, or any of lots of the kinds of work we've been talking about. I mean, piles and stacks of writing binary code ones right. and zeros that I took a computer science class in college and I dropped out halfway through because it was too difficult. <laughs> it needs to be perfect or else it won't run right. at all. Right, right. Yeah. Down to every last little detail. Absolutely. So that's that's a lot to hold. Yeah, I'm even thinking of um, my the the editor of like some of the people that work on the astrology podcast and and editors that edit the audio or the video and how much time they put into it. Or my old editor Stephen Kopic, who who was Austin's brother, that I kind of lucked out working with him for many years and getting the podcast going because he just had this ability, both a great technical skill and like ability to do what he does. Um, as well as like min wearing many different hats and having many different skill sets, um, but also uh, you know the, the the willingness and the ability to sit for long periods of time trying to perfect something, um, but also you know having enough 
um, wherewithal to know when to stop and when it was like good enough. Yeah. And the editor can make or break this story, you know, in a film or in a podcast, I'm sure. Yeah. Um, especially if it's the kind of podcast where you're editing the content to tell, to frame it in a certain way. Yeah. Cool. Well, Cause you're a publisher at this point and you know, the process of like when somebody, when an author or let's just say a creator or creative creates something, sometimes they want to do this huge version of something and they have this huge idea in their head that once they put it into paper or something like that, like with a movie, for example, it could be like 10 hours long. And then somebody has to sit them down and say, no, like nobody's going to watch this. You need to cut it down and we need to remove this part, this part, and this part in order to make this consumable or easily digestible and, and palpable to an audience. But going back to one of your earlier points with that particular type of work and with how important we just kind of described that it really is, it's unseen work still. And it's right. also unappreciated. I mean, how many people get bored and like go to the kitchen when they do the editor awards and the Academy Awards? In fact, didn't they cut them out at the last one? I think that's one of the ones they cut is it? Out okay. <laughs> because it's not as exciting because people are like, who are these people? You know, but uh, but also interesting that quality in Virgo of not always valuing the self enough and not valuing that work enough. Maybe that is why Virgo gets drawn to that kind of work that's a little bit behind the scenes. And but but how does Virgo learn to value their own work enough, I think is a is a good question. By looking to their non-Virgo placements. There you that's go. how I've done it. <laughs> right. Or th or through encouragement from their their friends or something right. like that that might help them yeah. to like um, you know, recognize that. That reminds me, you mentioned like editors and how that's often like unsung work and not recognized. And that's been one of the things over the past decade, for example, with like um, Star Wars and George Lucas is a lot of people pointing to Marcia Lucas, um, George Lucas's ex-wife who edited like the first Star Wars. Mm. And a lot of people try to argue like saved the film in post-production where the first cuts of it weren't very good or like, right. like it wouldn't have been as successful, but she was able to like cobble together um, this movie and like make it work. And then it went on to be hugely successful. But then it's like, that's another example where it's like the front person, the director, you know, kind of gets all the accolades. Yeah. Editing's a tough job and it does not get the recognition that it deserves. That is for sure. Mm -hmm. um, having like an editor film school friend, uh, it's kind of interesting to see how much effort and work it takes to go into it. Mm -hmm. But it really is just not recognized. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, but it can be very important. So that's a good overarching sort of archetype and thing of having a special skill. And it's a skill that you might not be fully recognized for, but it's one that's important because it's the thing that kind of like keeps the world working. And you're sort of like the hidden like superheroes in some instances that are able to keep things running on time or, or keep um, you know, cities running, uh, even if that's not something that everybody like sees, um, you know, visually. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. All right. So, um, let's see, where should we go from here? We've talked about, um, the contrast with the preceding sign, the sign that came afterwards. Um, one of the other contrasts I, I like to go into sometimes is the elemental triplicities, We've talked a little bit about like Taurus versus Virgo at this point. I'm trying to think if there's any other things. One of them that's actually important that we touched on really briefly, but I think those are the two signs that are the most connected with like plants and with the growing of plants and cultivation. Um, Taurus, I think, being the sign ruled by Venus and having the moon exalted there it almost becomes more about the process of like nurturing something and like and like growing something from birth and like raising it up and supporting it and giving it um subsistence or like water and food but for virgo there's like this other cultivation aspect and there can be also this aspect of like um sort of raising things and using them for medicinal purposes or other things like that I know that's something that you're super interested in, right? I actually took a poll when I was in college with uh, the uh, Purdue Science uh, Department of Botany specifically, and I asked every single kid in the botany program um, what their big three was. And if they didn't know, I was like, find the time of birth, get back to me. We were stuck with me all semester. We're going to figure this out. And I took a poll to see how many of them had Virgo, Taurus, and Capricorn placements. I could not find a single one that did not have one of them as their luminary. 
Wow. Um, yet alone their rising signs. So that was always really interesting. Virgo and Taurus were definitely more apparent. There was only like, you know, a hundred or so kids, but that's a good, still. That's a good yeah. amount. A, a lot of the, the studies I've done are on a few less than that because I do these kind of niche little studies of mm-hmm. particular focus. I think that's pretty strong testimony. I wish I still had all of that data. Mm-hmm. I have it in a notebook somewhere, but I didn't write down all of their birth dates all the time. Because sometimes they would be like my friends in the program. So I'd be like, oh, let me add you to my astro.com account, which has far succeeded its 100 charts. So <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> they right. have been long gone. Yeah. Uh, that is a struggle in that early stage of, of astrology is that 100 chart limit. Like, <laughs> yeah. like it gets rough. And then you got to start like deleting some. And it's like, you know, I just bought the <laughs> year yeah, okay. thing. See, I was like broke for a long time. So it's like you have to delete charts and it's like, which of your which children ones? are you going to murder? Oh. At, that oh, point? at first I like, did it just celebrities. I get rid of all the celebrities. Okay. And then you I said get rid it of the mine. Scorpio way, Chris. Yeah. Well, I'm just, <laughs> I'm just saying it's, it's hard like knowing who's getting like voted off the island of like the hundred, you know, chart examples. Whereas my mind is like, I'll just add them back later. Yeah. Look okay. at them for a different source. Right. Um, no, you're right. That is more worried. What that is a Scorpio is like who somebody has to die. Um, so, uh, but you're bringing it back to plants. Your degree is in botany. Yes. Um, and I'm specifically a botany and plant pathology graduate. So I am a plant doctor. Mm. So I don't fix people with medicine. I fix plants with herbicides and pesticides and whatever disease control they need. Okay, like if they get like a fungus or something like that and figuring out how to manage that? Yep, and and being able to identify like what's the difference between like one rust versus like northern corn leaf blight or um, this is going to be corn from the Midwest, you know, Uh, corn and soybean kind of stuff. There's difference between like fungal molds and like water molds. So it's obscene, but it's uh, a lot of agriculture, you know, a lot of plants uh, need all of that information to be able to survive. There's like a huge disease that's actually wiping out a lot of corn in the Midwest right now called uh, uh, tar spot. There we go. It took me a second. It's been a while. (laughs) But um, it's just these little black dots that come out and we can't in a lab uh, solidify it and grow it not in a uh, controlled like off of the corn itself. We can't control that environment and grow it in like a Petri dish. So there's no way of understanding how it is devastating so much. And that just intrigued me. And then I just switched my major from human pathology to plant pathology and I've mm. been in love ever since. Okay. Wow. That's like um, with like bananas where there was like in the 20th century, something that wiped out like the entire type of banana that used to exist, mm-hmm. right? Anybody that says that they don't like GMOs say you better never eat a banana then because bananas are genetically not what they were 50 right. years ago because we genetically modified them to be clones of themselves so much that they're unique and they wouldn't be able to grow without propagation and it's because there was some kind of blight or something like that that wiped out the initial or like main type of bananas that used to exist in like the mid 20th century Mm -hmm. and the same can be said about the american elm tree too because there was um i forget the disease's name now but there's a huge blight now we only have chinese elm trees here Mm. so so what is why don't we like dwell on expand on that a little bit of why Virgo might be associated more with plants or um, different things like that? Like, where does that come from? Is it because it's an earthy sign? It's ruled by Mercury. It could possibly be because it's like earthy, I guess. And Mercury likes to do things with its hands. It likes to be active. Um, and an earth sign kind of brings it to that tangible reality. Whereas, you know, uh, more Gemini qualities could be more, um, I'm doing things with my hands, but I'm doing interpretive dance and that's what you need to see, you know, kind of thing. Right. Um, I think of when I think of Virgo and plants, I think of like the apothecary mm-hmm. totally, and like going into an apothecary and they just have like tons of jars of different herbs and different plants and stuff all over the wall. And they know they're very knowledgeable about what each one does and like what the effect each one has on the body and how it can be used in order to try to um, either alleviate and heal things or to try to balance things out. Mm hmm. I like that image too, because when you think of it, you think of things in little jars that are organized and labeled and I'll, you know, hopefully. I have six boxes full of them back in my house. (laughs) (laughs) Absolutely. Yeah. All labeled intricately. Otherwise I forget. It's kind of hard to see what's a crushed up leaf versus a different crushed up leaf if they're not labeled. That makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. Sometimes you can tell if they're like whole because there's like a whole taxonomy that you can go through and like figure out what plant it's from. But if it's just like crumbled up. 
Labeling is important. Yeah. Labeling, lab labeling is definitely a Virgo thing. <laughs> and uh, I think maybe you could argue, although this is, doesn't work for half of the world, <laughs> but it's a problem that we just have in astrology because we've used these images for so long. But if we're looking at, you know, the Northern hemisphere and the seasons and the Virgos coming around the time of the harvest, and that just makes you think of plants kind of naturally. Yeah. That's a really good point. Yeah. Cause so Virgo is the last sign and I, and I do use that. And I have talked a bit about the um, seasons, especially this year as we've been doing one sign each month. And as I've focused on the quality of each sign and like what the experience is outside during different parts of the year, the North in the Northern hemisphere, where the um, signs of the Zodiac originated and where some of those qualities were first developed. I think there is something that's like still relevant about that and useful to sort of meditate on. But so Virgo is the last sign in the summer season in the Northern Hemisphere. So it's right before you get to the uh, fall equinox at Libra um, and you move completely into a new season. So so you do start to get to like the harvesting part of the year. Yeah. And, the, and you get, with that image, you get the busy work and the, you know, reaping the fruits of the whatever you've grown and mm -hmm. separating the wheat from the chaff. And a comparison is Taurus's planting season. You know, it's that mm. like early ish spring. It's when you want to put your corn in the ground and then you harvest it by about now ish time. Right. That makes sense. Mm -hmm. So the idea of harvesting and that's that's part of the like imagery of of Virgo is like the the maiden or or is sometimes shown like like actually like harvesting wheat or some things like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then Capricorn and it's winter and we're all gonna die. <laughs> right. <laughs> no, Capricorn's just the off season when you're planning everything that you need to do for next Taurus season. But then the anxiety of planning again happens at the beginning of spring. So you're like, oh, now I got to go grab this hoe and this tractor attachment and all of these things. I know what I want to plant and where I want to plant it. Did that back in winter, but yeah. now I need all the physical things. Totally. Well, and also Capricorn is like, you know, you're almost you're you're at the beginning of the winter season, and the nights are the longest, mm -hmm. and the days are the shortest, and like the weather is the most cold, and and Saturn is that sign ruled that first sign ruled by Saturn. That's also a dry Earth sign, and so that's the point at which all of the things you did earlier in the year, in order to you know, if you did a good job growing and cultivating your plants. And if you did a good job like harvesting and storing things away, then it's like you're okay, you're in good shape during the Capricorn season, um, just sort of getting through the winter. But if you did a bad job, then the sort of ramifications of that become the most dire um, at that point in the year. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the accountability function is strong in that sign, I think. Yeah, right. and I think it starts with Virgo, you know, with maybe one of the first looks at like what's not working here. But then Capricorn is that fuller experience of taking stock and being accountable or you know holding yourself accountable or just just the accountability as the act of measurement so just taking stock of you know what did i do what did i produce and what do i what do i have you know i feel like mm. each of the earth signs have a lesson that they need to learn and a way of going about that lesson but each of them handle it with a different level of maturity like taurus is a little immature about not trying to stereotype or anything at all but Taurus can be a little immature in the ways that they deal with failures and learning the lessons from those failures, which is usually I'm just going to ignore this and not deal with it because it's easier. Uh, Virgos are, let me dissect it and try to understand all of my flaws. But then there's the, they're lacking the wisdom that can be found in Capricorn from the failures, at least in my opinion. And that's just from Venus, uh, Mercury, and Saturn's point of view. I don't think necessarily just because that's like the order of yeah, them. Yeah. I do think that the Saturn rulership with Capricorn can take the judgment to the next level mm -hmm. for sure in the accountability process. Um, you can have that stern judge or inner critic or a voice of negation. You know, Saturn's definitely a no planet. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's something that Virgo and Capricorn share in common is a, a sort of criticalness and I, you know, for example, like people all the time ask me like what my Virgo placements are because uh, <laughs> they see that as a quality in me or they see my focus on like the details and things like that. But I don't actually have any planets in Virgo. I just have a Mercury Saturn conjunction, which I think people sometimes perceive as um, Virgo energy because of that ability of, of Mercury Saturn combinations or, or even of Capricorn placements to be able to see the flaws in something or 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 to as you said like reject or negate something um 
Yeah. So it's a similarity between, I think, those two signs or those two energies. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But I'm, a, I'm an honorary Virgo, I think, because of my Mercury-Saturn conjunction. <laughs> That's what I like to say. Um, somebody did point out that my the 12th part of my ascendant, if you divide the signs into 12, two and a half degree segments, that my 12th part of my ascendant's in Virgo. So that could be my Virgo energy, but I tend to associate it with the Mercury Saturn conjunction. Mm -hmm. I think that's right on. And then I also think another gateway with your chart is the Scorpio, because I think that the Virgo and Scorpio energy, just for another comparison while we're doing those, is is uh, those signs are sextile, but I think they're, um, you know, in the in the chart, if we have Aries on the ascendant, they're both signs that are um, in a version or uh, in quincunx aspect to the ascendant. And there's an uh, in both of them an unsettled energy, and this is a word that kind of comes through analysis of that aspect in modern astrology. But it also syncs up quite nicely with just the word aversion <laughs> uh, from traditional astrology. But that unsettled energy at the as is is kind of like a baseline of Virgo and Scorpio too. And for Virgo, it's it's a baseline of you know what's what's wrong with the situation or what needs to be fixed or repaired or made better. And in Scorpio, it's a, it's an unsettled energy that just keeps wanting to go deeper. I think, and and people may be sensing that that as well. Uh, yeah, that's a really good point. Wanting to go deeper because that's a really good keyword for Scorpio is like getting to the bottom of something and going like all the way. You're into, known for being a little thorough. A little bit, yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, Stephen Forrest, when I did the episode with him on astrology and reincarnation, I mentioned in passing that I used to be a barista at Starbucks, and he cracked a joke. He was like, "That you must have made, you must have been a very serious, or made a very serious cu cup of coffee or something like that." And he sort of cracked a joke about that. Right. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, so Scorpio and getting to the bottom things, and then Virgo, there can be like a similar energy of um, wanting to cover all of your bases and do a really thorough job of something. Mm -hmm. I feel like Scorpio needs information to survive, and Virgo just needs information to thrive, but they still need that deep seated, detail oriented information. Yeah, like Virgo is like doing the numbers and seeing if the numbers add up and analyzing the data and like. Scorpio is like, um, you know, the the spy that goes in to get the information or, or to to obtain the secrets of of something and and then bring them back and use that for their own purposes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so maybe that's also a similarity there, also between those two signs that are in sextile. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. So that's good. Um, we've talked about the all the the Earth signs. Another section we might move on to is talking about. Um, the four mutable signs, since Virgo is the second mutable sign at this point um, after Gemini. And um, the other two mutable signs are Sagittarius and Pisces. And I guess we've talked about uh, Pisces quite a bit at this point. We've talked about Gemini a little bit. So the one left that we haven't touched on at all, and it would be good to touch about talk about their commonalities, is Virgo and Sagittarius as two signs that are square. So there's a little bit of a tension between those two signs because they don't see eye to eye when it comes to element since uh, Virgo is an earth sign and Sagittarius is a fire sign. Um, they don't see eye to eye when it comes to uh, gender or when it comes to diurnal nocturnal when Virgo is a nocturnal sign and Sagittarius is a diurnal sign, but they do um, share quadruplicity or modality in common, which is that they're both mutable signs so there, there's a certain amount of like adaptability to both of them. Well, this is my moon sign. Okay. So I am a first, first quarter moon baby. And uh, it's not a fun tension sometimes because uh, that Sagittarius is almost like a, a need to super fan and like get super excited about things. Then the Virgo is like overly critical. So it's like mm, you're not as good at what you think you love the most as you think you are. At least that's how I have expressed it in my my own personal life. But that's a really interesting way of saying it. Yeah. That, but that square of that that zealot Sagittarius energy and that really radical deterministic almost Virgo energy is just very conflicting. I mean, they do work well together and can work really well if done correctly. I just personally haven't figured that out yet. <laughs> sure. So I mean, maybe a part of what's there is there could be. Well, I don't normally think of Virgo as a super like pessimistic sign maybe there can be a little bit of tension between a sort of the criticalness leaning into more of a pessimism versus uh more of a exuberant exuberant like optimism of sagittarius mm -hmm. yeah i think we're back to the you know mercury versus jupiter rulership and 
that you know you get there that way. But like you said, Mercury's not necessarily pessimistic, pessimistic, but because it's mental and in its rulership of Gemini and Virgo, there definitely can be, you know, when Gemini's going poorly, you know, apathy and um, complacency can be can be problems like, or even just like I already I already know what that's about and not kind of wanting to delve any deeper. And and Virgo can definitely go into the cup half empty territory pretty easily and quickly. Um, you know, complaining is a, a well beloved trait of Virgos everywhere. <laughs> well, complaining is a form of criticism to an extent. You're just not being direct about your criticism. <laughs> but and then then uh, yeah, Sagittarius that square is 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 interesting because um, it's interesting in um, you know in, peop- in people people in relationships between people with the I think the the Sag the people with the Sagittarius planets can feel um, like their balloons been punctured a little bit by the people with the Virgo placements. Um, mm. Just the, even if you're thinking about the, the air or the, sorry, the earth to fire, just, you know, Virgo, what Virgo is pointing out is probably real, but the Sagittarius might not want to go there or accept it, or it doesn't even think it's important. And so they can, that, that can be, um, that can be hard uh, for both signs in that respect on either side of the relationship. Yeah, so the Sagittarius friend might be like, "Let's go, let's jump on a plane, let's go take this trip to a foreign country like tomorrow." Yeah, and Virgo can be like, Do "We don't, we need to get our vaccinations. We need to like, <laughs> what's like, the language? Let me grab a quick book." Yeah, yeah, <laughs> we need to like learn the the language and like every we need to plan out the trip. And, right. and Sagittarius is like, "No, we just need to go like right now tomorrow, and that's right. that'll be fun." Right, and Virgo says, "Fun." What is what is that? What is this fun? <laughs> right, it's not. I'm doing the numbers on this, and it's not adding up. <laughs> What's the purpose of it? <laughs> right. Yeah. Is it going to contribute to my growth? And and <laughs> it, can I learn from it? <laughs> no, I don't want to go. Right. Yeah. No. I'm, uh, anyway, just just all joking aside, it's it's a. I think it's a challenging square of the mutable squares. I think it's one of the more challenging. Uh, that might just be all my experience. I feel like with the um, shared rulership between the other ones, you know, with Virgo and Gemini and with Sag and Pisces, that creates a bridge mm-hmm. that isn't as as easy as easy to find with the Virgo Sagittarius piece. I always just find it interesting too about how the mutable signs are the two planets that oppose each other almost in their their meanings and rationales. It's Jupiter and Mercury, the big thinker and the small detail oriented mastermind. Well, both can be masterminds, I guess, but. But mainly, um, mainly the Virgo. Yeah, mainly the Virgo. <laughs> <laughs> um, but that is the whole mutable square, you know, with cardinal signs and or um, fixed signs. You don't really get that same kind of polarity between two planets. It's just two key players we've got going on here. And you can really see, I think, the nuanced differences between each of those mutable signs um, just by this discussion about Jupiter versus Mercury almost. Yeah, for sure. And... Um, it it's tricky because on the one hand, some of the contrasts are almost more stark in some of the other um, oppositions and squares and things like that. Uh, like you know, the opposition between the two luminaries and Capricorn, mm-hmm. or sa- the two Saturn ruled signs, or um, Venus and Mars, and and those signs like Aries and Libra and so on and so forth. You would think of combinations that Mercury and Jupiter would have more in common or be able to get along more. And in some ways they do, but in these signs, we really do see where some of those contrasts come out. And they, you know, they can work together. I think that with this opposite signs, it's a little bit easier to see how one sign can offer an antidote to what's um, out of balance with the opposite sign, and it's harder to find that in the squares. But you can you can find it if you kind of dig a bit. And for the uh, Virgo Sagittarius square, you know that the meaning making that Sagittarius can provide through planets in that sign can really uh, help out the the Virgo um, placements for sure, even if there's some resistance to that process. I feel like it's just the dual body nature of all of these signs, you know, mm-hmm. the ability to adapt and to take on smaller roles that almost reflect parts of them that oppose them. Sure. Yeah. I do think, I don't, I don't know what you think about this, Chris, but I think of all the mutable signs, you know, one of the things we say about Sagittarius doesn't fit with mutability as well. And that's dogmatism. And it's about having like a fixed point of view is 
one way that a non-astrologer might even describe dogmatism, right? And so, you know, how does that how does that work um, in in practice? And and uh, and it's just a thought. Um, but of the of the signs, it seems to be potentially the most or the least flexible. And yet, I think that if you're doing your Sagittarius parts well, but let's just imagine Jupiter and Sagittarius because it makes it more simple to describe. But your worldview when it's healthy, you should be evolving based on your lived experience at all times rather than kind of like fixed. And that that's kind of like living the mutability in a in a healthy way, I think. Um, I, whether every Jupiter and Sagittarius person does that or not, I think is a question. <laughs> but what do you think about that? Um, yeah, adaptability is a really good one. I mean, we're, when we're talking about um, that, sometimes of Sagittarius, I think about like the late um, Kelly Lee Phipps, who had some Sagittarius placements and you know, the, one of his last projects towards the end of his life was like, he was just like, I'm going to make a documentary on astrology. And he's like, I don't know anything about filmmaking or anything else, but I'm going to buy a bunch of equipment and I'm just going to travel the country shooting interviews with people and I'm going to learn as I go. And that's a very Sagittarius way to do things, but it's like it happened and he got it done and it eventually came out. And there were some issues because you could see like in the interviews as he was learning as he went. And sometimes he'd like, record his audio in like a really echoey room and it would be really bad or he'd record another interview outside and you'd hear like the wind blowing mm -hmm. and he would learn as, as he went and i think that kind of approach could be really like hard for like a virgo to deal with where they would want to plan things out better and like know the technical specs of things and have some mastery of that ahead of time but on the other hand that approach also can have a like an enlivening effect i think on virgo to help sort of push it to um create more rather than hold back and wait for things to be perfect uh, before doing anything. Totally. So there can be something good about the energy and the tension between those two that can be productive in, in some ways. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So um, all right. So that's Sagittarius and the mutable signs and adaptability as an underlying archetypal Virgo trait, I think to some extent. Uh, as a core thing. I don't know if there's anything worth dwelling on there anymore in terms of the mutable quality of Virgo. Is there anything else that either of you can think of? I like the Virgos are tweaky bumper sticker from earlier, just but being adaptable, you know, I think that with the function of criticism, which is, you know, a useful and important function in the world. And it, but when it's, it, it can obviously be done in negative ways. But at its heart, you know, it's like, here's something that needs to be changed. And Virgo, I think, is willing to both point out what needs to be changed and to take action to change it. That's like the earth part of the sign is it's Virgo, where Gemini can kind of stay in their heads about something. Virgo's um, like, what can I do with this information? Mm -hmm. Like, how can I put it to use? What can I, how can I embody it in the real world in a tangible way? What can I do with it? And but uh, there's a willingness to adapt to situations, to make changes internal, external, um, that I think is real, real evident. Yeah, yeah, and and also um, the ability to do multiple things at once, I think, is an important quality. Also, that I would associate with Virgo almost more than any other sign. I mean, maybe Gemini to a certain extent, but and some of that is I think about some of the early Hellenistic astrologers like Dorotheus when they're talking about electional astrology. And he talks about um, if you put a mutable sign on the rising sign, or if you make a mutable sign like a Virgo prominent in your electional chart, that you'll start something, but then be before the first action is taken, there'll be a second action that will have to be taken, and, and the second action will be brought to completion first before the first one, and then you'll have to go back and, and do the second. Um, and it you know it thinks it makes me think of that, and makes me think of things like Mercury retrogrades, where you sometimes have that experience of. You know, doing something, thinking it's finished, and it should be a thing that just takes one um, effort, and and then it's done. But then you end up actually finding out that the first thing failed, and you have to go back and redo it. But usually, the second time you do something, it it often comes off better than it would have the first time. Right. I I mean, I think that's a great description of a a really useful Virgo energetic and like being allowing yourself to go with that process rather than kind of fighting against it, I think is, is really key in terms of like, you know, inner psychology. 
Yeah, I always think of Virgo as that, I mean, it is mutable, but it's still earth. It's that clay that and you can get stuck in clay. It can be a little <laughs> obnoxious to wiggle your way around in. Um, but yeah, 100%. Yeah. Maybe that's kind of like an astronomical, more astronomical rationale for the criticalness of Virgo is that, you know, Mercury retrograde is going back and having to redo something or going back and having mm. to revisit something and something sometimes revise something if yeah. there's a problem with it. But that idea of doing something over again, um, being somehow core in that that archetype, but, but getting better as a result of repetition. And just being willing to do that because you want to get it right. Whereas some other signs might not want to put in the effort to do that. Like, oh, that's a waste of time. You know, I've already been over that before. Right. Or, you know, or the Sagittarius perspective of, you know, learning as you go through direct experience. And it's just a different, it's a totally different energetic and way of, of acting. But I think you described it really well. Yeah. Well, and it also makes me think of that. I don't know if this idea has been debunked, but that idea of like the, doing your 10,000 hours that it takes 10,000 hours yeah. to like master something or master any one um, technique or approach to something that it just happens through doing it over and over again with repetition and like I watch like a lot of comedy podcasts lately and I like seeing comedians talk about their craft because they always talk about how as a comedian you're just like terrible for like the first five years or whatever but you go up and you bomb but then you learn from it and through that process of like refining your jokes and refining your approach over a span of many years that you get better and you build up and build up and eventually can become successful or become good at your craft but it takes um, a huge amount of hours and a huge amount of um, being willing to fail at something over and over again in order to get better. Yeah, I do think Virgo needs some positive feedback along the way, absolutely, to keep inspired, to keep going. I don't mm -hmm. know if that's been your experience, but um, off on another side note, you mentioned comedians. There are some pretty amazing uh, Virgo comedians, and I think you know maybe we can look at at Mercury here as the ruler and gifts coming through that way. But uh, Jimmy Fallon and Melissa McCarthy, Amy Poehler, uh, Jack Black, um, Lily Tomlin, classic. Nice. Yeah. Uh, and there's some others. There's there's a few uh, that I didn't mention. There's some controversial comedians with Virgo Sun as well. Okay. <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, that con a lot of comedians are kind of <clears throat> under fire these days for their material anyway. But, uh, but who, yeah. Who are the controversial ones? Do you want to say, or do you want to go there? Well, the fir the first one I that came to mind was uh, Dave Chappelle is a Virgo. Okay. I was really surprised to see that one. Right. I and I don't have anything to say about Dave Chappelle because I I have never seen, believe it or not, I I know I live in the modern world, but I've never seen him do one joke. So I've never seen a show of his. I have no I know nothing about him, but I just know about the controversies. Yeah. Robin Williams has his Venus in Virgo too. Nice. Mm. So another comedian. His okay. aspects are pretty amazing. I mean, yeah. he's got some great, I think he's got a great Mercury Uranus aspect and so much stuff that just makes really great sense in Robin Williams chart. Let me pull up his chart if you But I, I think Jimmy Fallon, I love I love Jimmy Fallon and Melissa McCarthy as as examples of embodying that Virgo archetype because one of the things we like about both of them is their ability to make fun of themselves. They can be self-deprecating in a way that doesn't make other people uncomfortable or, or that doesn't make other people kind of like bad or wrong. I feel like those two individually have also watched a lot of great like TV show hosts, comedians and stuff do their thing and learned from their mistakes, what's worked and what hasn't worked. Right. And I feel like that's a trait that a lot of Virgos really embody, but especially with Jimmy Fallon, like yeah. he took over the the Tonight right. Show yeah. and he was like, I've seen how this has been transitioned before. I've seen how it's gone. And he absolutely killed it with ratings when he first took it over, Totally, um, regardless of how people want to view him. But yeah, he's good at getting the numbers in. That's for <laughs> sure. <laughs> yeah. And he has that kind of, um, I don't know if you want to call it humility, but he has that quality that makes... Um, other people, it's really good for an interviewer where it's he doesn't not sort of sitting above them. Mm -hmm. He's like getting down to their level mm -hmm, exactly. and really grounding himself in interviewing other people. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And then to your other point, Melissa McCarthy, um, she she only you know came into the public eye later, so we have to imagine that she went through that process you were describing, Chris, of kind of like fine tuning her work and her comedy until she got either to a place where she was ready or till she got developed enough skills that she started to be recognized for, for her work and, mm -hmm. um, kind of famously great at, at just 
Well, um, I think mm, expressing that energetic of humility in, in lots of ways that, that are great for comedic effect. Yeah. You mentioned self-deprecating humor, and it made me think immediately of Conan O'Brien, who has Virgo rising and uh, that Uranus-Pluto conjunction of the 1960s, like right, right. on his ascendant. Yeah. Um, but he's, you know, sometimes his humor can be self-deprecating. That's really interesting. I hadn't thought about that before. But like, if you think of the different like styles of humor, that I think right. self self-deprecation could be like a Virgo thing. No, that's like Jack Black too. Like Nacho Libre, he's just. <laughs> Making fun of himself that whole himself. movie. Exactly. Right. Yeah. But not in a way that, you know, there's a way in which some comedians do that that make you feel uncomfortable. And mm -hmm. I like to think, I mean, maybe this is just me, but I like to think they do it in a way that doesn't. No. Yeah. Like, you, it's almost as if you can tell they're comfortable in their own bodies mm -hmm. and they're just living their life, doing what they want. And they're having fun with the whole experience. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It's like that elevated uh, ability to lean into that. Um, and almost like acknowledge the flaws in something, but I like to own it and transcend it in some ways and to use that to laugh with people rather than just being like the subject of being laughed at or something like that. Right. They play like the strategic game, you know, they're able to flip the scenario around. They don't get bullied. They bully themselves. <laughs> right. That's easier because they already, a Virgo is a Virgo's worst enemy. That's for sure. I think that's well said. Yeah. And they're they're witty too. They're witty and yeah. Um, that's you know Mercury skill or like clever is another word. Clever is of. a great better word. I think witty's maybe better for Gemini. Mm. I think clever is probably good because clever is a kind of humor that sometimes you don't laugh out loud at. Right. <laughs> right. You're, you're, you're like you're, you're like, like oh wow that was a really good line. But. Yeah. <laughs> right. Or you, yeah, you're like that's smart. Like I see that joke, and that was a well constructed joke, and you almost like intellectually like laugh at it, even if it didn't like make you burst out laughing or something like that. Yeah, you know, Cameron Diaz is also a Virgo. She has Sun, Mars, and Virgo, and she does comedy quite well. But with a lot of these folks too, there's that Earth quality of it being embodied, or just you know, literally, it's kind of like a, a little bit more of a physical comedy too, without being slapstick in what I imagine might be more of a Sagittarius way, but a little bit more, but it's still like a, a body kind of comedy. Like th there's something about the physicality, whether it's their gestures or movements or just, yeah. Yeah. That makes me think of, you mentioned Robin Williams earlier, who has um, Venus in Virgo, but also Saturn in Virgo. And um, let's see, here's his chart. You can really see, you know, he has so many great characters and you can see them through all of the different planets in his chart and him, you can just, and you can see him in like five minutes, go through every planet in his chart, embodying those different characters. He's pretty amazing. Yeah. yeah. I think there's only a couple people that are able to do that very well, like right. play multiple roles right. for one movie. Right. Um, and I think Robin Williams is definitely one of them. It's that mercurial aspect, the, the man of many hats. Yeah. Uh, he had so he had Scorpio rising and that Mars conjunct Uranus in uh, Cancer and that unexpected, sometimes kind of like zany or wacky uh, quality. Um, but but then, yeah, it's Mars. It's and what I was remembering was Mars conjunct Uranus, not Mercury, and it's because Mars is the chart ruler, mm -hmm. right? But he still has that Venus conjunct the South Node at ten degrees of Virgo in the eleventh house, and Saturn up there at twelve or twenty-seven Virgo also in that sign yeah yep yeah and for those folks interested or into evolutionary astrology that would be a pretty big deal uh, venus conjunct the south node in virgo and and how he um i mean i can i'm just picturing some of those characters like i'm not, like i said you can see kind of any planet in this chart and coming through some of these characters but you can see some of those characters in his work too mm-hmm I feel like he truly understands the really gross, disgusting process of like mutilating his own facial features, his own disguise, dressing up as, you know, Mrs. Doubtfire in order to get the laugh, in order to get what he wants out of it. Yeah. Um, are there any other comedians or anything like that? Another one we could go into at some point is musicians as well. Um, yeah, you mentioned cleverness, and uh, I will plug my absolute favorite rapper in all of existence, Mac Miller, who has a Jupiter um, or his Jupiter in Virgo, and he is very well known. And he has a Capricorn stellium, but he's very well known for being very clever in his raps. 
he was easy Mac with the cheesy raps. Uh, even from like a, a young age, uh, he was able to rap about, you know, drinking with his friends and, um, and taking pro- improper substances, uh, things like that. But What are improper substances? Weed. <laughs> well, uh, uh, yeah, that's up for debate. I, I mean, there's more. <laughs> yeah, Mac has done a lot. But he... Um, He's very clever in that sense. But then also Kurt Cobain and uh, Billy Cogan for being self-deprecating. Those Virgo risings. They're also Pisces stelliums if you want to talk more about that that axis. But Absolutely, yeah. Like we've hit it. Yeah, and he's got uh, – Kurt has Uranus and Pluto and Virgo on the ascendant. Mm-hmm. It's really tight. Yeah, I think was, they both do because aren't they both like a, only a week or so apart from each they other? They were born within a week of each other. And what's interesting is they're born, I believe, on the other side of like a Mercury station – this is the chart of Kurt Cobain. He was born February 20th, 1967. He has 19 Virgo rising with Pluto exactly conjunct the ascendant at 19 Virgo and Uranus uh, conjunct the ascendant at 23 Virgo. And it's opposite to this pretty substantial Pisces stellium that consists of the Sun, Mercury, Venus, and Saturn. Um, and he has, so you can see Mercury's right there at 18 Pisces and the Sun is at. Uh, one Pisces, and down in the bottom right corner, it shows stations, and Mercury is two days away from stationing retrograde. Um, so there's that, and then Mars is down there in the third house um, in Scorpio, and Mars is 15 days away from stationing. So multiple things about that chart, but um, just to contrast, so here's Billy Corgan's chart, who's also Virgo rising, has the same um, Uranus-Pluto conjunction near the Ascendant, also has Sun in Pisces, but look, he's on the other end of the Mercury, mm-hmm. where Mercury's stationing direct at this point, but still in Pisces, but it ends up giving them the same Mercury and Pisces placement. And because Mars went retrograde, um, Mars is also roughly around the same degree, but it's retrograde in Billy Corgan's chart. And I was watching some old videos of both of theirs recently with that Mars in the third house and the place of communication and both of them being known for just like like screaming and we- wearing out sometimes they're like vocal cords in the process of that as sort of like a notable feature of their their music. Yeah, I think though with with Billy Corgan, he's I think that Moon and Gemini is a real resource for him. Mm-hmm. I mean, we we know that, you know, uh how things kind of turned out for Kurt Cobain and and his moon being in Cancer just adding to that uh, water and him ha- also having a bit more Pisces going on there um yeah well the other thing is like the um saturn changed signs which i think is really interesting in terms of that co-presence so that saturn right. moved Saturn's out in of, pisces yeah in kurt's chart right yeah. yeah so it's much more coloring that entire pisces right. stellium in kurt's chart and, and also creating more tensions with the ascendant and virgo and you know that that self-critical tendency and uh, there's another keyword there that i'm forgetting but martyr with Pisces, maybe <laughs> I didn't know if that's where you were going, but a little bit. But he just in his like his suicide note, like famously referred to himself as like a sad Pisces, um, or or something to that effect. And you really pick up on that um, Virgo Pisces axis, but also just the heavy role that Saturn was playing there in and some of the issues with with depression and ultimately like not being happy. Once he achieved like fame and stardom, and that actually being something that that overwhelmed him and that made him feel not not good, um, being constantly in the spotlight and things like that. Yeah, yeah, and I feel like Billy was able to more like fuel that through his lyrics and like put like bullet for bullet, butterfly wings or bullet with butterfly wings um, to say like I'm a rat in a cage and to sing about that. But then Kurt kind of had you know Dave Grohl's chart and Courtney Love and whatnot influencing him to write about certain things and he wrote more about like the drug side of it instead of like the healing the the feelings that he was going through and the depression that he was going through he just kind of like threw it all on his own back so he was living so much through that other person um it's off topic a bit but that's an important point too about the both both of their charts with the pisces over there and and a little on the descendant and being mm-hmm. a bit more porous and and influenced by the others and so kind of choosing those others really wisely being really important and because they are going to have a really strong influence. Exactly. Yeah. And it's all the more so in both of their charts because with Virgo rising and having the ruler of the ascendant being Mercury in the seventh pole sign house, 
um, it even more not just directs them there, but sometimes can make um, more of the person's like identity, but be partially shaped by the people that they're in close re- relationship with. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. I think you can see the fingerprint of that really, really well. Sure. Um, others, there's some other pretty great musicians though that take us in a different direction. We have to mention Beyonce, Sorry, or somebody's going to get mad at us. Yeah. I, so I have a. And com- they're probably going to be in the comments already. Why haven't you talked about Beyonce? <laughs> because she doesn't have a time chart. <laughs> right. Yeah, she doesn't have a time chart. However, I do have a funny anecdote about that. Did you, both of you see that news story like a few weeks ago where it was like this um, story where there was somebody I forget her name, but she was in Glee who who said this report that supposedly like Jennifer Lopez once did auditions for like backup dancers right. and then um supposedly and I don't know if it's true so it's not verified but like asked people how many virgo at the end of the auditions once everyone had auditioned how many virgos are in the room and some people like raise their hand and then all the people that raised their hand supposedly she then said thank you and then dismissed them right just for being like virgos yeah. and it was kind of this like weird story because that's obviously like not a good use of astrology and raises all sorts of issues yeah. where normally people that are like actual astrologers like wouldn't do stuff mm-hmm. like that. But I always thought it was funny when I heard that story because then I immediately thought of Beyonce and I was like, imagine if like Beyonce is one of the, <laughs> the dancers. Jennifer Lopez is like, no, get out. Yeah, yeah. And she's like, here. get out. And you just like dismissed somebody this like, oh my you goodness. know, this amazing dancer right. and, be, and becomes known for it like right. even way more than yourself right. because you have like a prejudice against Virgos or something like that. That's that's why you don't would not. That's your like astrologer um story about why you don't want to do that cautionary sort of tale, cautionary yeah. tale yeah. when it comes to typing people just based on zodiac signs i think i've noticed with the most pop astrology is people hate on the mercurial signs they hate on gemini mm. and virgo the most in my opinion you think so you think that, well you think that as a virgo but the, oh, i mean the scorpio gets it a lot because scorpio gets really bad stereotypes but i feel like yeah. they don't get hate because so many people will defend and say that they love they really Scorpios. really hate on still. gemini's though you're they right they really do they really do yeah, but then there's like Leos sometimes Leos, will absolutely. will get some hate for certain things. I mean, what are the signs that get the least Taurus. hate? Taurus. Aquarius usually gets forgotten about. <laughs> Let's be honest. Because sure. they're off excluding themselves That's from the funny. group. That's right. funny. Um, yeah, so okay, I guess there are. I might have to do a ranking at some point of well, the signs it, that it, get... It's time for another poll. Yeah, we right. got to do a poll. Which <laughs> yeah. zodiac sign do you hate the most? Get the most hate. But... See, but then everybody just talks about their own ex, right. their own personal That's experiences. Right. That's yes. right. That's right. Like, oh, I've been screwed over by one too many Aries. That's yeah. the sign that's going on number yeah. one. Well, yeah. well, yeah, and that's the danger, especially among a like less educated public that know much about astrology and the nuances and how you have to look at a person's entire chart and how it's more complicated. And that even if you had this experience with one person who had this manifestation of these placements, that doesn't mean you're automatically going to have this experience with somebody else. But that might be you know, where something like that Jennifer Lopez story was coming from, if that was a true story. Yeah, that one, that story was interesting because I use JLo a lot in uh, teaching for kind of some positive Leo traits where, you know, when you have, I think, um, cultivated self love as a Leo in a really healing and positive way, you're then able to have that kind of generosity of spirit with others that we describe with Leo sometimes. And I think she does that really well. And you can really see that on on that dancing show where she's a judge, um, where she can be so generous and supportive of other folks. I like to I like to think that maybe that story is not true or that that it's been uh it's a little bit something about that game of telephone because I I I got, I was it really interested in that story because I used J Lu's chart and I was like no not J Lu I can't I, you, you know yeah. if she's hating on Virgos I have to stop <laughs> using her <laughs> chart now but um I so I looked at into the story and it that the person who told the story, it really was a, I heard somebody said that somebody blah blah blah. And that's uh, the story. It's and it's mouth. like oh, okay. So it's hearsay. Yeah, it's really just for clicks, I think. All so right. you've done the critical analysis of I did the story. critical Thank analysis you. of this I story. That. <laughs> yeah. it, it didn't check out. <laughs> yeah. I'm just looking pulling up her. So we don't have a time chart no, for Jennifer Lopez. I would really wish we did because I really like using her chart, but so she says Sun and Mercury and Leo, and the only thing she has in Pluto is like or in Virgo is Pluto and like late Virgo. And she probably didn't know that. If the tr- story is true, she might not have known that. Okay. Or but. then she'd just probably say, well, Pluto's not a planet, so it doesn't matter. Well, there anyway. you go. <laughs> well, we will withhold judgment then about whether that story is true and uh, just use it as a like cautionary tale of like encouraging people as professional astrologers not to type people purely based on zodiac signs or things like that. 
Yeah, and I think what we have with Beyonce is a nice lead into. I don't know if allowed, I'm allowed to say this on the podcast, but you can edit it out. But there are a lot of Virgo badasses, mm-hmm. and uh, I think we can put Beyonce in this category. But also Joan Jett mm-hmm. and Idris Elba. I mean, come on, right. uh, yeah. hard agree. Yeah, <laughs> hard agree. Yeah, and that notion of like humbleness and everything that we were talking about earlier, while you know, true and relevant shouldn't be overstated in terms of the ability of Virgos to like rise to the occasion and excel in their field and like stand out um, for their, you know, own skills and, and traits and other things like that. Yeah, totally. Yeah. I mean, I don't know. I, when I first saw that Joan Jett was a Virgo, I, I just, all I could think of was you know, the lyrics to, you know, to bad reputation. I don't give a damn about my bad reputation. There's something really interesting that we don't talk about a lot that I think we could spin as a Virgo dynamic there. I think that's more her. I think she has an Aquarius rising. It, yeah. it correct me if I'm wrong, but I think, I think because we share that and I was like, oh, that's interesting because she also has a Virgo sign. Because you don't give a damn about your reputation? Or, well, no, <laughs> because there's a very you particular, that, so I thought well, there's a very going. particular part of Aquarius that it, it really does not give any. Two super, Fs. Yeah. yeah. No, mm-hmm. yeah. Not at all. The, not a single one. rejection of social convention is definitely an Aquarius trait mm-hmm. and um, I associate that with sad, like uh, modern astrologers that use the modern rulerships tend to associate with Uranus as like a rebellious thing. But I sometimes see it as more of a Saturn principle of like a, of rejecting things and standing outside the, of Sat- things. Because Saturn is the no, right? Yeah, I go there right. the same direction. I think, yeah, I, th- I think that's a whole nother, we could do that as another podcast, but that's a um, passionate topic of mine. The you just gave a lecture on that. Uranus rulership of of Aquarius and how I think that might be a mistake. Okay. That could be, that would, that would be a good topic. Um, I, we don't have a time chart for her, but this is Beyonce's chart where she has her son at 12 degrees of Virgo. And um, she does have a, I mean, I did I point this out. She has a very large Libra stellium. So like the delegation from Libra may want to claim her uh, from Virgos, but I mean, that son is still in Virgo. Yeah, there, but there's still some, you know, she has, she has this um, elegant quality. There's some um, old, cla- there's some classic Hollywood actors like Greta Garbo, who, ha- who are Virgos as well. Who- Lucille Ball? Mm. Yeah. Oh, she, sorry. I think Virgo, uh, Venus. Venus, not Virgo, son. Not, yeah. not son. She, is she Leo son? I don't remember now. I can look it up. <laughs> <laughs> not sure. Internet, tell us. Yeah. But uh, yeah, there's, there's, um, Oh, she's a Venus and Mercury, specifically in Virgo, but I don't know where Sun's on. So ball, double A chart. Yeah, the Mercury and Virgo rings mm-hmm. true, especially if you think about like if that portrayal of her behind the scenes that we just saw in the film with Nicole Kidman was at all realistic. You know, the just the amount of getting back to comedians and the and the um, attention to the craft and the work workmanship involved in, mm-hmm. yeah absolutely definitely learning from other people that have killed it i don't think like lucille ball would have been able to be lucille ball had there not been like other comedians coming before her doing the same thing hmm. that's that's something we haven't talked about which i think virgo you know gemini is a good mimic and i think virgo can be really good at picking up on something that someone has done and improving on it yeah doing it even better this is going to be a little bit controversial to say i'm sure but uh michael jackson has the sun in virgo and there's um there's a video you can see online of bob fossey dancing as the snake in the i think it's the jungle book i think it's like a um kind of dance version of that right but i think if you just google like bob fossey snake on youtube and if you watch that you're like whoa like all of those moves were replicated by Michael Jackson. And you could argue that he like took it to the next level, of course, and that he, I don't know if you want to say he achieved some kind of mastery of it or whatever, but he definitely was taking something someone else did and improving on it, at least with those particular dance moves. Yeah, that's a really good point. Um, and I, I don't like there's some, I can't remember, he may have like studied directly under Bob Fosse or something like that. So they he definitely, learned well, he it. definitely gave Bob Fosse some acknowledgement. I mean, he, was at at the least was really in love with his work. 
Yeah, but it's a good point it's that he definitely... It's pretty clear that he saw this specific video, though. <laughs> right. But then he definitely like took it to the next level, and he made that something. He like perfected yeah. something that was... You, you could see it there, and it's like more nascent form in some ways um, in the person that he took it from. That reminds me of... It's the idea of like sometimes taking something and remixing it um in addition to improving it like taking the best pieces from something and then putting it into something new um even though i don't think he had virgo placements but it just reminds me of something that you know different people do at different points like for example you know george lucas with star wars um you know was just taking pieces from like earlier things that he saw and liked like serials from his ch childhood and then creating like an updated version of that for the 1970s with like newer technology and things like that mm -hmm. so that's a good point in terms of sometimes the ability to take something to recognize the value and virgo can recognize the value in something but then also knows how to elevate it and to bring it up to the next level yeah yeah all right um other contrasts so i'm thinking we've gone through all of the major um connected signs that share some sort of major aspect to each other um one of the last things i've sometimes done in some of these episodes is then mention some of the signs that are in aversion um so we've already mentioned and talked about two of them which is uh leo and libra which are the adjacent adjacent signs which at least share some sort of um connection through you, you know that corrective function that we've talked so much about um, but the other two signs that are in aversion to Virgo are the signs of Aries, and um, the other sign is Aquarius. So I guess we mentioned Aquarius briefly already, right? Yeah, that one. That one I'm really still working on. I'm really interested in that one because I feel like there's, and this could just be because of my own experience with people, but. I feel like there's a little bit more of a connection with Aquarius. And I'm somebody who, well, I, I wouldn't go so far as to say I think Mercury's exalted in Aquarius because I think using that term, you know, has a specific reference that we should respect. I do think that Mercury has some real tangible gifts and observable gifts in the sign of Aquarius. And, um, and uh, maybe not as much in Aries. <laughs> I yeah, I can't think of anything to say about Virgo and Aries. Yeah, <laughs> but yeah. so it, yeah, it's like because Aquarius is that like one an, does feel more like oil and water. Yeah, Aquarius is an air sign, and and a lot of the air signs have this sort of stamp on them from the first air sign, which is Gemini, in this communicative or intellectual quality. Um, but yeah, when you're comparing Virgo to Aries. Um, so just in terms of the basic qualities of those signs and the reason why they have a disconnect, um, you know, Virgo is a diurnal sign or a mask or sorry, Virgo is a, a feminine sign or a nocturnal sign versus Aries is masculine or, or diurnal. Um, Aries is a cardinal sign. Virgo is a mutable sign. Uh, and Aries is a fiery sign, whereas Virgo is an earth sign. So they just don't share any commonalities between those two. Um, so what are some of the things though that are properties of both of those signs that you know don't quite get along drawn from those qualities i mean one of them we talked about with um aries in the first episode is that aries likes to do things very quick and likes to move very fast whereas i think virgo tends to be a little bit slower and a little bit more um uh, you know, doing things in its natural order in order to do it right and not wanting to like rush through just for the sake of getting it done. I think with that one, the, the, the desire to get it right supersedes the speed. Yeah, mm -hmm. I agree. Okay. Cause I was thinking about how I was putting up a bookshelf the other day. I just flipped to the last page of the instructions and looked at the finished picture and was like, I could figure this out. I did not want to stop and do every <laughs> step, right. you know, but, um, I still kind of see that. Whereas Aries is like the just do it, leap before you look kind mm -hmm. of yeah. energetic um, and just let's just take some action fire and based on some kind of passion, you know, fire and and uh, Virgo can definitely be more deliberate or cautious. Virgo can be pessimistic. We haven't talked about that. Virgo can also be like, you know, overly prepared. And that implies like having sat and thought about it and made some plans before mm -hmm. going on the trip like the story you were telling earlier with the Sagittarius you know comparing to Sagittarius just kind of like 
well, let's 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 get our itinerary together first. Let's not just jump on the plane tomorrow morning. Right. Um, right. So that kind of energy. I do think, though, just to come back to something you said, Chris, that I think, um, especially Mercury and Virgo, and maybe it's just Mercury and Virgo, but I think that can be a pretty speedy uh, placement. I agree. Maybe not. Maybe it's but maybe Mer there's Mercury can be a speedy, yeah, because Mercury, Mercury, Virgo, yeah, Mercury is a quick planet, yeah, and it, it's the fastest of the visible planets besides the moon, yeah. So there can be a quick quality to it, um, yeah. but yeah, but it, but maybe we have to imagine that Earth kind of slows it down in some way, right? Um, yeah, versus fire, if we're just trusting the elements and the meaning in terms of like i would say aries is like impulsive um versus versus virgo i think is a little bit more planned out even if once it does make a plan it can execute it rapidly right mm -hmm. right what did rick levine say about aries ready fire aim yeah, yeah that's such uh, a, i use that one all the time virgo is ready ready <laughs> not ready not yeah. ready yet. not ready yet. Not ready. <laughs> yeah. not ready. ready question mark <laughs> yeah <laughs> about 800 more times and then maybe you could pull the trigger <laughs> right um, yeah, Aries is uh, shoot first and ask questions later, and it's yeah. definitely Aries is like the first through the breach. You know, if mm. you are, it's, if it's like ancient, like medieval times, right. and you're in a war and like storming the castle, like the Aries is the f one to go in first. Um, yeah. Whereas Virgo is probably the one that's like planning uh, the strategy or something like that. Yeah, I think strategies were. I think I like that word for Scorpio actually, and especially in the war context, but. I'm not so sure, maybe because of the mutability, if we, you, you'll read a lot that Virgo's like strategy or planning it out, but I don't know that they're like the planner of the Zodiac. I feel like they like structured logic more than they like strategy. Yeah. And that's a very similar, but very distinct difference between those two things. Right. All right. Maybe a better one would be like, they're the engineers. Virgos are like the engineers of the Zodiac that have like mechanical abilities. So they would be like the person like building the catapult or something like that. Mm -hmm. would that. Would that float with you too? How do you feel about that? I like I like, I like that. They're like the mastermind making the weapons for war. They're not planning about the war. Or making making the weapons be more efficient. Yeah. Mm, yeah. Right. Something yeah. something's gotta get it corrected. Yeah. Like, did you know if we like, you know, switch this around and tinker this around, we can hurl like twice as many rocks over yes. the castle. Tinkers wall. are great. Why not just set them on fire tinkering. too while you're at it, you know? Right. Some more damage in there. <laughs> yeah. That's Mar Mars and Virgo is like <laughs> setting it on fire and I mean, that's something I think, um, though, that could be good between those two is Aries, especially with Mars, has a cutting quality and, Aries, and Virgo with its um, editorial and ability to, to think critically. I think that combination, some good things that could come out of placements there could be maybe even heightening that ability to um, edit or, or know when or what to cut out or to like slice out of something. And just being willing to cut. Yeah. Yeah. Which is which is crucial because like, sometimes like cutting can be painful, like especially if you're like the author of somebody that's created something, um, you don't want to cut anything out of it, and that can be like a painful process removing things. But sometimes it's like a, a necessary process. No, that relates back to like the whole editor thing. It's like sometimes you got to take that little clip out. Sometimes you got to rearrange the whole thing just by getting rid of this one little bit, but it's necessary. And it is that pessimistic value of Virgo also to just be like, yeah, this is the part that needs to go. You don't want to do all of it, but you know, you have to. Right. Yeah. All right. So that's a good, those are some good qualities. There was some contrasting things, but also some, some positive reconciliation between those two signs as well. Mm -hmm. And with the, with the Aquarius side, I mean, one difference between the two of Virgo and Aquarius, I think that they have something in common in the sense that they I think there is, there can be um, an impulse toward improving things with Aquarius, but it's a bit, it's got a different focus where Aquarius has got a skill looking at systems. You know, I think that in Capricorn, we're building the systems or upholding the systems or, um, uh, and then in Aquarius, we're, we're looking at how those can be improved or made better. Um, but there's still an impulse to work within a system a lot in Aquarius and a lot of folks, but I think that ability to see the whole system, like you're using the engineer, you know, the Virgo engineer is the one that can come in and figure out the part that's broken, that's making the 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 doodad not work right. And the Aquarius person is is going, wait, this the doodad shouldn't even be over there in the first place because it doesn't relate to the whole thing. So it's a bigger picture view in a way, but not bigger picture in a Jupiter way. It's it's more of like a 
you know, in an engineering kind of way, but being able to take in a lot more of the information, I it think. It just plans a little bit more for the future. Right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So like structurally, structurally might be a good Saturn keyword. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, one of the incompatibilities between them is um, since Aquarius is like a fixed uh, Saturn ruled sign, there can be a, re- a resistance to change or a reluctance to change. And I think that can maybe be some of the tension between the mutableness of Virgo, even if it's in some ways like the the least Virgo might be the least flexible of the four mutable signs, which are generally the most flexible. Um, but nonetheless, I think Saturn and Aquarius might sometimes be um, even more resistant to changing things than than Virgo is, and that could be a source of tension between those two signs. Mm-hmm. Sure, no, I very much agree. Because going back to like that Virgo clay thing, clay is really hard to work with. It may be mutable, but it's the least mutable of the mutables. Mm. So, yeah. So Virgo is clay. I like that. Mm-hmm. Uh, did we talk about Cancer and Virgo? No, we completely skipped Cancer. I was looking at the chart and thinking about it, but we missed a sextile there. Yeah, that's the other the preceding sextiles. We jumped straight to Scorpio, the other water sign. But Cancer is um, the final sign that we have not talked about at all, and. Those two signs um, share some things in common because they're both uh, nocturnal signs. Um, They are in sextiles, so they have somewhat complementary elements of water uh, and earth. Uh, And yeah, what? So, what are some of the qualities we would associate with those two signs that are either complementary or that are complementary? I feel like they're both nurturers. I mean, very yeah. nurturing in different ways, but they still have that quality to them. Yeah. When, well, when a Virgo is fixing something for you and it isn't unsolicited, <laughs> that's their love language. Yeah. Right. It feels like they're taking care of you, but they're taking care of something. Um, but it can, that can feel like care. But the cancer version of care is, you know, it's a water sign and it has a bit more emotional warmth to it where it feels more like a a really nice hug, right? Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. And cancer ne- definitely, I don't think, has the attention to the, to the details and maybe not the interest to to fix something except maybe, you know, your broken heart. Yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. One yeah. of the things we talked about with cancer being associated with the moon was like like cooking as a way of like helping to take care of somebody or to like, you know, nurture somebody um in an act of of that in some ways. And I, I kind of think of Virgo as like would be the one that would bring um, you know, really healthy like organic foods, you know, to cook or something like that. Totally. Or the Virgo could be making the food for you because you can't make it for yourself and they're doing it to help you out versus right. the cancer is doing it to make you feel better maybe. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Like if you're sick, like your Virgo friend is the one that like shows up with some food and medicine and stuff to take care of you. Especially the medicine. And these are the ones you should take in this order. And I know because right. I've done it myself. And <laughs> yeah. That. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Here's some Vicks Vapor Rub too, just in case, even though you don't have like a stuffy nose, right. but being prepared for the inevitable. It's funny, and my experience is in those moments, it's the one time where people don't complain about the unsolicited advice. Exactly. It's when you're actually helping them. <laughs> right. yeah. That takes me back once again, and maybe the final time to the um, the herbs and like the apothecary stuff, because I sometimes think about like how some of those herbs, like people have been using them in like folk medical traditions for forever, for like hundreds or thousands of years. And just the question of like, you know, how did people figure out that like certain herbs like did certain things and had all these different effects? And a lot of it was through, you know, trial and error and, and people trying a little bit of something and like seeing how it went and like noting it and noting those different things. And that was probably, you know, somebody with heavy Virgo placements that, you know, had that ability to notice the minute differences of something and to sort of write that down and keep sort of records, even if not like written sort of like, you know, in memory to build up that sort of like archive of, of knowledge about different plants and medicines. Yeah. I definitely risk my life to try out some cool basidiomyces or something, just right. a type of fungus. Some different, <laughs> different mushrooms and things like that. Yeah. Just be like, what does this one do? Okay. Right. If it was for, if I knew that like the information wasn't out there and the only way that I could find out is if I ate it, yeah, I would do it. 
Okay. That might be your moon and Sagittarius <laughs> influence coming through with, with the Virgo yeah. because I wouldn't do anything that I it might risk my life at this point. No, you would take it back to the lab and run a bunch of tests on it to see if it's poisonous or Absolutely. not. Absolutely. Okay. So no strange mushroom. <laughs> no strange for mushrooms you. for me. Okay. But I'm really curious to see how it goes. So let me know. <laughs> well, I have, you know, pretty good micrology background. Awesome. So I feel like I could do a pretty good job. You're the one. Identifying awesome. them. Brilliant. Um, all right. Well, we are at two hours, so I think, and we've gone through all of our different signs of the zodiac and our contrast, and I think we've been able to draw out some really great stuff, you know, by going through those contrasts, and it's developed a pretty good picture. Um, before we wrap up, I mean, are there any other keywords or any other major things we're going to be kicking ourselves for that we wanted to mention, but we didn't during the course of this? I'll let you know tomorrow, probably. Yeah, yeah. tonight, <laughs> two in the morning. Like, are you thinking about it? And yeah, absolutely. Yeah, there's other things we could talk about, but I think, you know, I think that's a really great start. Oh, can we dispute the neat freak? stereotype oh we haven't done that yeah Yeah. we didn't do that no that's a good one yeah so cleaning neatness uh, aversion to like clutter or where we go with organization yeah i I think okay things should be organized to a degree but organization is subjective sure but there's definitely like earlier you mentioned like the labels of in like an apothecary of the different things that's because i need that you, to be organized. So you need things to be organized. There's an impulse to organize. So does that extend to, because I also think of things like when people build computers, like cable management, that they have mm-hmm. like amazing like cable right. management. I think of that as a Virgo thing. Yeah. Does that extend to the cleaning thing or, or are you saying there's a, there's a division there? No, I think it extends. I just think that so many people are like, oh, like I introduced myself as a Virgo and they're like, oh, your apartment must be amazing and immaculate. And I'm like, no. Absolutely not. It is a cluttered mess, but it is an organized, nice cluttered mess. Mm. Well, when you say you, when you were talking about it, it, made me wonder if if you you like the kind of organization where you understand it and know where everything is, but it might not look organized to other people. Is that yeah, yeah? Is that do you feel the same, or are you very much the pens need to be in the exact same? No, I'm not. I'm not the way that you might think, or I'm definitely not like the stereotype. But on the other hand, my I, I actually. This may be controversial to say, and that's going to come out in the comments. <laughs> okay. But yeah. my experience with my own friends is that Cancer and Pisces are the messy kind of signs of the zodiac. But, mm. um, but you know, my my Cancer friend, every time she comes over, she says she has Sun and Cancer, Venus and Mars and Cancer, and and she says, you know, I love coming to your house because it's so nice and and calming. But it also makes me angry because I'm like, how do you, (laughs) it makes me feel bad because I can't do that. Um, But I definitely like things to be in order in the house, but I'm not um, obsessive or, um, you know, I wouldn't call myself a neat freak, Mm -hmm. but definitely it's in order in a way that people comment on and notice. But my closet's not like organized by label or anything like that. Okay. Um, I, I did have, I have to admit, I did have a time. In my twenties, where I color coded my t-shirts, I hung all my t-shirts. No, and I had them color is that. the worst. I know, I had you more. color code by sleeve length, or you code by sleeve length. That's right. how you organize. What are long sleeve and short sleeves and weather types? Yep. But why do you color too? That's too much. Well, here's another fun conversation for two Virgos. But I worked in video stores when I was younger in record stores. And do you organize the videos by alphabetically by genre or by director? I'd say by genre, because that's in a video store. Most people are going to want to look at all the horror movies together. They're not going to be like, oh, let me look at just at Christopher Nolan's work, you know? And there's a lot of like directors that go like other routes with a lot of the things that they direct. So like, I I would say genre. See, that brings up something for me is I saw somebody's library recently. And uh, this is something I think is a major like Mercury versus Venus difference. But with books, um, I, I went up and I saw like a poet's library, and he had it organized by color. So the books were just purely based on like the color of the outside of the book, and and that would drive me crazy because to me, more Mercury inclined, I feel like you need to organize it by either by like you know author or by by theme or something right. like that. But their primary impulse was the the aesthetic of just like you know grouping it in certain colors. I would go insane if they weren't alphabetical by author. Okay, yeah, yeah. Maybe so. it was a Libra who introduced that, organized the books by color. And yeah. in fact, a real life anecdote um, had a Libra realtor, uh, and I just know because she asked me to do her chart. Who? Um, that's the first thing she did to my bookcase, and she was like, "Sellers really like, or buyers really like how it looks to have the 
the books organized by color it just creates a nice visual impact and and when she started doing it something inside me just started just broke yeah <laughs> <laughs> just can't yeah, yeah. i was like oh, no my that book doesn't go next to that one my friend tried to do that once i have all of the one piece manga and they're all different color coded bindings but the colors don't correspond to the volume numbers and the volumes are one through like, what, there's like 98 of them now. It's, it's ridiculous. But she was putting them all in the different colors. And I was like, what What do you think you are doing? Absolutely not. Those go in numerical order, please. The story <laughs> needs to be told in the story, not the way the colors look. Okay. So you, what we're getting at is you do have some organizational impulses. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I definitely think of like the libra librarians and like the Dewey Decimal System. I feel like that's a Virgo thing. Oh, 100%. A yeah. thousand percent. I don't know. I sometimes wonder if it's a little bit Gemini too, though. I feel mm. like the Gemini might be the part that names the things, but mm. doesn't necessarily put them in order. So I feel like they were, might work together. I don't mm -hmm. know. Putting things in order, like that's a good overarching Virgo keyword, mm -hmm. though. I think that it combines a lot of the topics, right. just the idea of, of order yeah, or orderliness. And I'm definitely the kind of person that I, in a best case scenario, I have a clean kitchen before I start cooking. And, you know, I, if it's the kitchen's not clean and I need to cook, even if I'm running late, I will clean the kitchen first. I just, it's like, and I was telling my students uh, about this last week. And to me, it just feels like it's a, it's, you know, relating it back to Virgo, it's preparation for the mental space mm -hmm. to be able to kind of do its thing. It's the same thing um, with lots of different kinds of work that I do. I like to kind of organize the space first. Uh, yeah. I mean, that's always nice because your like environmental mind state or your mind state is develop or well, your mind state <laughs> is dependent on your environmental state. Right. There we go. That yeah. was a difficult sentence to get out there. But but just back to your first point, there are definitely messy Virgos out there. Mm -hmm. And uh I think uh another thing I, I, I like to think about with some of these keywords, if you put this person is learning about and then you put the keyword there. That works more often than saying this person is blank, right. you know? Sure. I actually love that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. No, Thank that's you. Yeah. a beautiful way of phrasing it. Mm. And then it's not putting labels on people, shoving them into a box. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. Um, and last point, it's not a really great ending point, but another example, Trey, I just thought of when we were talking about organizing things and that question of whether to organize books by like color versus like uh, author or something like that, it just reminded me that. Wasn't like Kim Kardashian like the closet organizer of Paris Hilton at first? And she has like Venus and Jupiter and Midheaven and Virgo. But they actually then... just did an episode about that on Keeping Up with the Kardashians. Oh, for, you did? What? No, no, they did. Oh, they did. They, yeah. um, I think in the, like, the second episode of the newest season, they talked about how oh, Kim was like thing. super close with uh, Paris Hilton. And that's how she kind of got famous was through organizing her closet. Through organizing wow. her closet. And sh so here's her chart. She has... Sagittarius rising, um, Venus, Venus and, and Virgo. Jupiter. Venus and Jupiter. Yeah, conjunct the midheaven in the 10th whole sign house in Virgo, but then Saturn, Sun, and Pluto in Libra in the 11th house of friends, which is really funny uh, to oh. me. So. Kim Kardashian is a great case for even when planets are very uncomfortable in Virgo, it still works out because Virgo is that amazing. <laughs> right. <laughs> you heard it here folks first folks. Yeah. yeah. No, that's great. I don't know anything about about her, but I, I do have used Paris Hilton's chart because she's an Aquarius and a really great example that contradicts a lot of stereotypes. She does have the moon in Leo, so there's there's yeah. an interesting dynamic going on there. But right. Um, but yeah, sometimes with Venus, supposedly, you know, having its fall or depression in Virgo. Um, but it's because when you put Venus, which is like an artistic and aesthetic planet in a sign that's supposed to be more about numbers and orderliness, that it may initially um, have trouble initially like uh, functioning in that environment because it's a little bit different than what it's used to. Um, it can still function well. It just has to express that in some way like through you know organizing the books according mm -hmm. to color or something like that rather than number. Or you could just think about it that it, it does it in a way that maybe not um, you know second nature to Venus or maybe you know Venus has to make a little bit more of a stretch to get there. But in this example that you just used, it's about you know it's still a Venus intention of beautifying the space and it's right. doing it in a Virgo way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's bringing benefits to the native through the expression of that placement mm -hmm. ultimately. Yeah, and and I don't you know I've heard sometimes it said that 
that uh, planets in detriment and fall can be um, uh, used well when they're being used on someone else's behalf. Mm, okay. And, yeah. And that's just, you know, an idea. These no. are all just ideas. <laughs> yeah. No, that would be interesting. I'd like to actually yeah. like to explore that more because sometimes that notion of, um, yeah, being in the seventh or being in the sign opposite, bringing in a component of the other, mm. that could be really interesting insight into how that does work out positively in some instances. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Totally. Cool. All right. Well, um, in order to keep things on time yeah, and in the interest of brevity, just because I don't want to take up too much more of your, either your times, and in order to, you know, since the Virgo Virgo episode, you know, conciseness being, what is that? It's that phrase like concise as the brevity of wit or something like that. I don't know I that don't one, know but I like it. I bur I butchered whatever that phrase is just now, <laughs> but uh, somebody in the comments will let me know what the actual phrase is. Um, so, where can people find out more about your work and what do you have going on? Um, I am actually going to be giving a talk on Twitter spaces for KazimiCon. Um, I don't exactly know what topic I'm going to be doing yet, but you can find out more on Twitter. All my handles are Astro Rosalie, uh, A-S-T-R-O-R-O-S-A-L-I-E, and that's also astrorosalie.com. And then you also um, have, you're on TikTok. You have a pretty large TikTok uh, account or somewhat. Yeah. I mean, okay. It's, uh, it's a small village following me and I don't exactly know why, but yes, I am also on TikTok. <laughs> okay. Awesome. D tell us about what is KazimiCon? Um, I, it's just like a small little um, group of astrologers that are just putting this like, you know, casual, informal kind of talk together for the Venus Kazimi. So it's going to awesome. be at the end of October. Okay. Mm -hmm. And you do consultations as well, right? Yes. Cool. Mm -hmm. All right. What do you got going on, Tony? Yeah. Um, most of my work is done through Astrology University these days at astrologyuniversity.com. And uh, most of my focus is taken up on uh, running our four-year training program. So we have a four-year program training astrologers, to either be professional astrologers or just to you know work with astrology more deeply in your own life. And we have four cohorts going at once now, so it's it's uh, this is the first year that we have that, and it's feels pretty great. Um, it was it's just an interesting moment for me personally to be in that uh, to have come this far from the original idea to seeing it manifest and just seeing how people engage with the material and and everybody that's involved. It's pretty it's pretty amazing, and I'm really really happy with the way it's going and. Um, yeah, we're training a whole new generation of of astrologers, and it feels really great. So that's where most of my work is, and I also do some webinars through there. And we have lots of great astrologers ev almost every weekend doing webinars. You know, Demetra George, Mark Jones, Kelly Surtees, just tons of really amazing folks. I'm just so gifted to be able to work with these folks, and uh, and we the weekend webinars are shorter form. They're like an hour and a half, and um, really affordable and accessible and we cover a lot of specialty topics usually we just cover whatever the speaker's interested in uh that particular year or month and um and and so they always end up being really really great and i think that's it i'm not doing uh personal consults anymore just because i spend all my time teaching now um the one thing that i do um that i'm debating whether to do again next year, but that I love doing is I've been doing Saturn return boot camps with folks. So uh, it's kind of like a group coaching experience with uh, like 10 to 20 people where everybody has the same Saturn placement. And um, the last two with all the folks with Saturn and Aquarius, it was really amazing. I'm learning so much too about Saturn placement in each sign by doing this work, but it's really cool for the attendees because they get to come together and they all have a shared placement and they're kind of going through that experience at the same time. And so they get, you know, insight and support from me, but I think at least 50% of the experience for folks is connecting with the other people who are having that same experience and living through it together. And just experiencing each other's stories is pretty, pretty magical and fun to be a part of. And um, I may do that again next year. Um, I shouldn't though. <laughs> we'll say that. Well, because I mean, of time, but but yeah, that's a really cool concept because you know we're getting towards the tail end of Saturn in, in Aquarius at this point. So people are kind of like finishing up their Saturn return story in Aquarius that started way back in early 2020. But that might be needed, you know, because there's going to be a whole new group or a whole new co cohort that begins theirs next year when Saturn right. moves into Pisces. Exactly. Yeah. 
and the, they'll probably, yeah, I mean, every Saturn group needs support, but yeah, they'll probably really need the support. And then the other thing is uh, I got a couple of pretty great publishing projects. Um, one is getting is a reprint of the Elements of House Division, which is a really cool book. It's a technical book about uh, how the different house systems are calculated. Uh, uh, I think it's a pretty non controversial book from your perspective. I think <laughs> is that the, <laughs> but, the the one that was published by the AFA at first? It was published by the uh, the Faculty of Astrological Studies. Okay. Yep, and um, just got the rights to publish that. Uh, get that back in print. We use it. I use it as a reference book for one of our courses where I go through different house systems for the students to teach them how the different ones are calculated and when certain ones were used. It's a little bit like a history of houses class in a way, um, but uh, just to introduce students to the math of some of the different house systems and some of the reasoning behind them. And it's a, it's a, it's a great book. It's written well. It's, it's easy to follow and understand, but it's out of print. And so it's like, don't buy it right now because it's like a thousand dollars or something. And okay. Don't just because I mentioned it, please. I mean, I'm the person who actually drove the price of that book up. Because <laughs> you bought all the copies. Well, no, so, no, okay. just by talking about it in class. Um, and uh, it was like three dollars when I started the program, and now it's like a thousand dollars. But, but um, is that the one by? It's a by Ralph Holden. Yeah. Yeah, so it was not the same as James Holden. Correct. Yeah. Um, so that was before whole sign houses had been rediscovered. Yeah, so it's not that's not really in the book. Right. Um, yeah. So it's really more for kind of understanding a lot of the quadrant systems and some of the other house systems. Um, so it's it's not like up to date. I don't think I'm gonna put that in there because I don't, you know, he's not around and I can't ask his permission to do that. And I don't want to write something that he didn't write for the book, but yeah. I may just mention in there, you know, that there's a whole bunch of work that's been done on the whole sign house system since then. And so, you know, this is a starting point, but you'll want to kind of explore more. Um, but anyway, I'm really excited to get that one back into the, into print. Cause I think it's a really useful book. There's not another one like it. It's a nerd book for sure. So it's not going to have big reach, <laughs> but the other, the, I don't know if I should say this one out loud, but I'm going to, um, uh, uh, Mercury stationing. So I hope I don't uh, regret this one. But, right. We uh, recorded this on a just what a day or two after day, Mercury yeah. station retrograde. Yep. Uh, so today I forgot to mention the data, but today is um, September 11th, 2022. And we started a, just after like 3 30 p.m. here in Denver, Colorado. Well, maybe I won't say it then, but I will say um, that I, I, I did get the green light to get um, a couple of out of print books uh, by Dane Brajar back into print. And one of them I'm really excited about. So uh, yeah, but hopefully that project will keep moving forward and we'll see how it goes. That's awesome. Yeah. I love how one of your things over the years has become like helping to publish the books of a bunch of astrologers. And, and I think of publishing to some extent as kind of a Virgo thing as well. Yeah. And I love sun Jupiter on the, on the IC Jupiter rules, my midheaven to so Pisces midheaven. Okay. Um, so they're publishing can kind of come, you can get there that way as well. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. All right. Awesome. Well, thank you both for joining me for this is amazing. And I think we've pretty thoroughly like covered uh, Virgo for this episode. Yeah. Good. Goal achieved. <laughs> yeah. Good job. Good, right. good teamwork. All right. Well, thanks everyone for watching or listening to this episode of the Astrology Podcast, and we'll see you again next time. Special thanks to all the patrons that helped to support the production of this episode of the podcast through our page on patreon.com. In particular, shout out to the patrons on our producers tier, including Thomas Miller, Catherine Conroy, Christy Moe, Ariana Amour, Mandy Ray, Angelique Nambo, Issa Sabah, Jake Otero, and Mimi Stargazer. If you like the work that I'm doing here on the podcast and you would like to find a way to support it, then please consider becoming a patron through my page on patreon.com. And in exchange, you'll get access to bonus content such as early access to new episodes, the ability to attend the live recording of the month ahead forecast each month, access to a private monthly auspicious elections report that we put out each month, access to exclusive episodes that are only available for patrons, or you can also get your name listed in the credits at the end of each episode. For more information, go to patreon.com slash astrology podcast. The main software we use here on the podcast to look at astrological charts is called Solar Fire for Windows which is available at alabe.com, and you can use the promo code AP15 to get a 15% discount. For Mac users, we use a similar set of software by the same programming team called AstroGold for Mac OS, which is available from astrogold.io, 
And you can use the promo code ASTROPODCAST15 to get a 15% discount on that as well. If you would like to learn more about the approach to astrology that I outline on the podcast, then you should check out my book titled Hellenistic Astrology, The Study of Fate and Fortune, where I traced the origins of Western astrology and reconstructed the original system that was developed about 2,000 years ago. And in this book, I outline basic concepts, but also take you into intermediate and advanced techniques for reading a birth chart, including some timing techniques. So you can find out more about the book at hellenisticastrology.com slash book. The book pairs very well with my online course on ancient astrology called the Hellenistic Astrology Course, which has over 100 hours of video lectures where I go into detail about teaching you how to read a birth chart and showing hundreds of example charts in order to really demonstrate how the techniques work in practice. So find out more information about that at theastrologyschool.com. And finally, special thanks to our sponsors, including The Mountain Astrologer magazine, which is available at mountainastrologer.com, The Honeycomb Collective Personal Astrological Almanacs, available at honeycomb.co, and the AstroGold Astrology app, which is available for iPhone and Android. You can find out more information about that at astrogold.io.